The Paladuro and Oman? You saw them in the cafeteria. They're drawing a crowd with their speeches. In the business, we call that recruiting followers. Shig and Yvette say to leave them alone. People should be free to associate with whom they please, even if it's not in their ultimate benefit. Paladuro and Oman don't share your philosophy. Sometimes I think you people have lost touch with just what kind of self-deluded idiots the rest of humanity can really be. So? What do you think they're after? A world of their own making. That's nothing new for Donovan. We've been trying that for a generation now. The way they were talking about Turalon? I'm thinking they're planning to take the ship. They haven't a clue as to how, yet. But if I know them, and if I remember the backgrounds from most of their followers, they're station people. Donovan must be a shock to their systems. You ask me, their ultimate goal is to turn Turalon into a station. They can live up in the sky, accessing Donovan's resources as needed. Stations aren't free places. Everything's ordered, right down to who lives where, does what, and when. It's a closed system. What if Turalon spaces first? Then they move on to Freelander. More power to them. From what I've heard, it's a ghost ship, haunted, and still filthy and unreliable. You know that Marston and two of his bunch had a meeting with Calico, told her in no uncertain terms that if she didn't space them home, they'd raise hell down here. Talina rolled onto her side, probing the darkness in an attempt to see his expression. Seriously? How'd you hear this? Katsuro Miso, one of the Marines, still talks to me. Marston and his people didn't want you, Shig, and the rest to drop any obstacles in their way. Yeah, they've got all their belongings and plunder stacked in crates by the gate. Got a 24-hour guard on them, just waiting for word that they can load and shuttle up to Turalon. Why would they think we'd want to stop them? How do I know how these things get started? Katsuro said he overheard them saying that Calico would give them her answer in a couple of days. Talina frowned into the darkness as she considered Marston. Must have been Shankara and Myers with him, if there were only three. Tough people. Honorable people. They didn't give a shit about the odds. They'd wanted to go home for years. Why didn't you tell me this? Because you ripped my clothes off when I stepped in the door. Somehow that seemed imminently more important. She frowned. Okay, so Marston's folk want to leave. They'll do anything to force Aguila into spacing. You know Paladoro and Oman. What will they do when they hear this? Not that I know them, per se, but I know their type. They're selling themselves to desperate and hopeless people who want to get the hell off Donovan and back to some sense of normalcy. They want to be leaders, form the new order. They promised me a third if I'd join them. Might have been a good deal. Maybe you should have taken it. He shifted onto his elbow and glanced around her bedroom with its curving outer wall. So what if they march on Marston's group? try and dissuade them from leaving. I know Calico's scared down to her bones about spacing. She'd do anything to put that decision off. They march on Marston's people? Marston's bunch will leave their bleeding bodies to pave the streets. They're not the kind of people you want to try and push around. Donovan pushed them, and they're still standing. There's always the Marines to keep things civil. They'll wait for orders before they intervene, right? Of course. By then it will be too late. She considered the ramifications. Shit. 
If Marston's people kill a bunch of soft meat, it'll split this community right down the center. Talina took a deep breath, then sat up and threw her hair over her shoulder. What are you doing? Getting dressed. I'm going to go stop this idiocy before it gets started. Cap rolled off his side of the bed and flicked on the lights before reaching for his shirt and pants. Then you'd better have backup. Your people might take you at your word, but the soft meat won't. They'll mouth off, and you'll shoot one before you think of the consequences. And that's bad? She asked angrily. Maybe they'd better figure out who the law is around here. Might keep a bunch of their sorry asses alive for more than a week or two. That's my towel, Cap muttered dryly. She slapped her belt around her hips, the pistol's weight reassuring. And what about you, Cap? Showing up at my side? Sort of puts you in the middle, doesn't it? Yep. Aren't enough people looking for a piece of your hide? And didn't you tell me that Oman and Paladuro made threats? Yep. So? You want to just walk out there and make a target of yourself? Be sure of it. If they're targeting me, and I've got your back, that keeps you safe. Why do I need to be safe? Because I want to get you home in one piece again tonight, so I can have seconds when it comes to ripping your clothes off. A flash of lightning illuminated his grin, and then I want to sleep for the rest of the night with you curled safely in my arms. They had just stepped out into the dark and drizzle when the sound of shouts and a shot carried from the direction of the shuttle landing field. Chapter 61 Calico paced before Margot Abibi as the captain sat at one of the tables in the crew mess. The woman's light brown eyes followed Calico as she spun and stalked her way back along the rank of chairs, pulled neatly under the long table across from a BB. I woke up from a dream this morning, Calico told the captain. Everything was so vivid. Home. My apartment atop the Transluna skyline. So much space. The elegance. Surrounded by art the soaring columns supporting the transparency that allowed me to look down upon the whole thriving city. She spread her arms, crying, And God, the food! Culinary miracles from every corner of Earth. The tastes like magic in my mouth. I wore the finest of fabric, gossamer, like a caress to the skin. She fixed her hard stare on a BB. I ran the damn board. They came to me. She nodded a fist, and beyond the splendor, the fawning board members, I could feel solar system. It's expectant, waiting for my orders. I am solar system. And just as I know this for certain, as I am about to order it all to function, to produce, and for all the people and machinery to commence their perfect operation, the door to my apartment smashes open. Everything stops, as Shig Mosadek, that Yvette woman, and Paris burst in. In that instant, solar system begins to shiver. Calico flung her arms wide, and boom! The whole pus-sucking solar system explodes. I pop awake. And where am I? Staring at the ceiling in my personal quarters on Turalon. Abibi shoved her chair back far enough to extend her leg, as if to ease a cramp. With her left hand, she rotated a zero-G cup around in circles on the tabletop. I watched the hollow record of the meeting you had with Marston, Shankara, and Myers. What are you going to do? You've got two days. After the way they talked to me, I could send the Marines down to kill them. That 
or round them up and transport them off to one of those abandoned stations out in the bush and strand them. Violate the sacred corporate contract? Calico placed her hands to her face, pressing on her cheeks as if she could force some kind of sense into her frantic brain. This is a world full of lunatics, all of them mentally disturbed and insisting they're sane. Are you going to space us for home? Abibi asked softly, sympathy in her brown eyes. It would be so much simpler if we just knew. Part of the desertions, it's the uncertainty. Order us to space, and I'll have the transportees shuttled up and we'll be headed out within six hours. Headed to what? Calico whispered. That's the nightmare. As you said, the uncertainty. Abibi nodded. You ever read No Exit? It's an old play they make people read in university. A Frenchman named Sartre was the author... It's a story about being stuck in a room in hell. That's what Donovan is. Like no exit, there's a door out. You just don't know where it goes. It could be salvation, or it could just be another deeper and more horrible level of hell. Calico raised a suspicious eyebrow. Tell me the truth. How many have deserted? About a third. I have sixty-seven officers and crew left. Abibi smiled. And yes, I can space the ship. As soon as I do, those transportees are going to be in training for ship's duty. If they've survived Donovan for this long, they must be smart enough to learn reactor maintenance, electrical even the finer arts of astrogation and field theory. Calico tried to see past the woman's light brown gaze. What do you want to do? Off the record, Margo. Give it to me straight. Abibi studied her coffee cup for a moment, looked for all the world to be at complete peace with herself. I'm for spacing, ma'am. That's just who I am, what I've always been. Tourlon's my ship. Whatever voodoo mathematics they programmed into the qubit computers, they got us here. Unlike those fools dirt side, I'm staking my future in the stars. Calico felt a shiver run through her. She thinks she can make it. The effect hit her like the cold hammer of doom. She took a breath, struggling to keep the room from swaying. When did I convince myself that she was going to urge me to stay? Captain, ma'am? A voice caused her to turn. Astrogation officer Nandi stood uncertainly at the main hatch. If this is a bad time... No, come in, Nandi. Abibi called. Nandi walked up, saluted, that glass-brittle look still behind her eyes. Got the final report on Freelander, ma'am. Chief Engineer Hans says she's stabilized. Reactors are synchronized and running at ten percent. She'll remain in orbit at the corporation's beck and call for as long as it takes to get a salvage crew on her. Thank you. Ayo. Abibi hesitated. Nandi? Chan just found another log. Thought you might want to know that it mentioned Kenji. Calico watched Nandi stiffen, panic seeping into her expression. Abibi seemed not to notice, a wistful smile on her lips as she toyed with her coffee mug. I'm sorry, Nandi. But he was one of the first ones they eliminated. It's a short reference, just that Kenji 
Samson and Pachulski, acted in defiance of orders. They were apprehended and killed while on the way to warn the transportees. Nandi's head had pulled back, as if the muscles in the back of her neck were contracting. That's all there was, Abibi said gently. I'm so sorry. Nandi swallowed hard, and then as though a cool breeze washed through her, she relaxed, almost smiled. Thank you, ma'am. Dismissed, Abibi told her. Tell the crew to prepare to space upon orders. She glanced at Calico. That is correct, is it not, Supervisor? Fear ran cold through Calico's nerves. Yes, Captain. Correct. But the way she said it, it felt like ordering herself to a death by slow torture. Nandi saluted, spun on a heel, and marched back straight to exit the room. It's all right to be frightened, isn't it? Abibi asked after the woman stepped out. Makes life sweeter, every moment like a tonic. Perhaps, Calico whispered. Chan really find Kenji's name in the log? No. Abibi gave her a conspiratorial wink. But Nandi didn't need to know that, did she? No, I suppose not. Part of being good at my job, Supervisor, is making sure that people in crisis have a way out that doesn't destroy them and others around them. That's how a good captain saves her ship and crew. Well, we all need to do what we need to do, Captain. Calico turned, nerved her muscles to support her, and walked with as much dignity as she could muster from the mess. I'm in hell, and there is no way out, she thought. Damn you, a baby! Chapter 62 Marston's people had piled their belongings in the narrow gap between the high chain-link fence that separated the shuttle field from the town and the back of one of the warehouses. The piled crates and storage chests created a breastwork that couldn't be flanked, not the sort of place a mob would want to attack. And it was dark, a shadowy area between the white cones of light where they illuminated the falling drizzle. For the moment, the attackers had broken off, shouting insults. The people behind the barrier waited silently, dark forms that stood resolutely, their hats gleaming slightly as they shed water. Cap drove into the melee, shouting, Break it up! You're in violation of civil order 117. Violence and inciting disorder. I'll have all of you rounded up and jailed. Dark as it was in the crowded space between the dome wall and the high shuttle field fence, the fighting, screaming brawlers had no clue who he was. The soft meat, trained as they were to obey the voice of authority, broke off immediately. Dark forms shuffled back into the shadowy recesses. You asshole, stand down, Talina bellowed or by God I'm going to do some ass-kicking like you maggots have never seen. Tal? That you? A voice called from behind a stack of duraplast crates. You bet your ass it's me, Marston. You want me to come back there and smack you on the side of the head so that you know for sure? We didn't start this, Marston called uneasily. They came out of the night, told us to leave. That right? Cap demanded, stalking toward the furtive figures who now backed away and filtered into the dark gap between the domes. 
That you, Taggart? A voice called from the other side of the fence. Yeah, Spiro? He saw the faint gleam of armor through the chain link. A flicker of distant lightning left no doubt. What the hell is going on here? Mr. Taggart, it's like Marston says. This mob came out of the night, tried to run Marston's group off. From the dark gap in between the buildings, Paladuro's voice called, You haven't heard the end of this, Taggart. You said you weren't taking sides. I'm not, you three-fingered fool. Get your people out of here and don't come back. Someone groaned, and Tal illuminated the form with her flashlight, and then another, and another. All told, seven people lay on the wet clay. Three weren't moving. Cap bent down, checking the first casualty. Thick blood on his chest was already cooling. In the light of Tal's flash, he touched the man's eyeball. Got no reaction. One dead. Talina leaned over another, calling, Bullet wound in the upper shoulder. She bent her head to her mic. We need a medivac at the shuttle field fence. Roused Raya out of her bed and anyone else handy. Looks like four wounded. What the hell were they doing? Marston called from behind his barricade of crates. The way they tried to drive us off. These are our things, our property and plunder. You're getting in someone's way, Talina told him, bending over another still form. Shot this one through the head. Shit. Cap walked over to the chain link. Lieutenant, what happened here? Just like Marston said, Mr. Taggart. They came out of the night, the bunch of them, armed with clubs and kitchen knives. Told the returnees to get the hell away from the fence. Started to climb over the crates to force them out, and bam. The returnees started shooting. You were watching all this through night vision? Damn, Deb. Why didn't you stop it? Didn't have orders she told him, a frigid tone in her voice. Remember orders? Or have you forgotten those, along with everything you once knew about responsibility, loyalty, and respect? From the darkness, another Marine snorted agreement. So you let them kill each other? Spiro chuckled hollowly. The supervisor tasked us with the protection of corporate assets. The returnees are all out of contract. Legally, they aren't our people to protect, only to transport. The transportees requesting transportation back to Transluna because their jobs were no longer available here. They are our responsibility. As events unfolded, I monitored the situation. Had the rioters threatened them, we would have taken action. Uh-huh. And most of your rioters are still under contract. They have been assigned jobs by the Triumvirate. Technically, they're not working for us. It's a gray area. Fucking space lawyer. What the hell happened to you, Deb? Use your head. We've got people dead and wounded. Where's your humanity? He raised his voice, calling out the dark figures. And what about the rest of you? You're all Marines. You took an oath. Don't lecture us about oaths, Mr. Taggart. You walked out on all of us, Talbot called from the darkness. Sir, Spiro snapped. You are a civilian. As such, you will not address my personnel. Any conversation will be with me, with my permission. You do not, at this time, have that permission, so turn your ass around and do whatever it is that you civilians do. You hate me that much? You walked out on us. I'd as soon cut your throat. Cap sighed and shook his head, knowing she could see the disgust in his expression with perfect clarity. Worse, 
What the hell was she doing on the other side of the fence? Did she think her tech was going to give her the edge on the chance Quetzal that might be prowling across the shuttle field? Stepping over, he found Talina was rendering aid to the third casualty. In her flashlight, a young man was grimacing, sweat popping on his pale face. A bullet had nearly torn his upper arm in two. His blood had pooled on the clay, streaks of it where the arteries had squirted. The cart's on the way, she said. Fortunately, two spots was on the comm. He's drafted the night-cleaning crew to help. In fact, that should be them. Cap glanced up where lights bobbed as they rounded the admin dome. Well, something still works around here, Cap said with a sigh. His heart was thumping sullenly in his chest. Damn it, those were his people, his marines. He'd trained them for two straight years, kept their morale up, built a sense of unit pride, and they treated him like this? Gotta see it from their side, Tal told him, as if reading his mind. But still, orders or no, they could have stopped this before it got started. Yeah, Cap whispered, a slow sense of dread building. But now that Paladuro and Oman's people have taken casualties, what happens next? How do we put the genie back in the bottle? I've never understood that metaphor. Tal's bloody hands kept the tourniquet in place on the young man's arm. It's old, Cap told her. Comes from the deserts back on Earth. Arabic, I think. Two spots rolled the cart up, the people with him, dressed in coveralls and smelling of bleach, gaped at the dead and wounded displayed in the flashlight's white light. Two spots said, Raya's on the way to the hospital. What you got, Tal? Help me get them lifted. Careful here. Keep this tourniquet tight, or we're going to lose him. Cap helped load the three living, started along to help, but hesitated when Marston called from the dark crates. Tal, you need anything from us? We square on this? Yeah, Lee, we're square. I heard it from the lieutenant. They attacked you. It was self-defense. You did what you had to do. But do me a favor. Keep an eye on the dead. I'll be back for them just as soon as we get the wounded taken care of. Yes, ma'am, Marston replied. Come on, Cap she told him. Something tells me it's going to be a long night. He started after her, hearing a snicker from one of the shadowy marines on the other side of the fence. Hope a Quetzal gets him, Tal muttered under her breath. Yeah, Cap whispered, feeling his own sense of cold betrayal deep in his breast. I'd cut your throat. The words lingered like a curse. Spiro had meant it. Chapter 63 Dan Worth nodded to Step Alenovich as he strode saucily down the hall and approached the door to the admin dome conference room. Alenovich, dressed in Quetzal chic, stood with a booted leg thrust forward, a large rifle tucked in the crook of his arm. That he'd been posted as a guard for the door, more than anything else, indicated the gravity of the situation. Hey, Stap. Dan, glad you could make it. They're inside. In a fit of irreverence, Dan flicked fingers to his forehead in a mock salute. Inside, the room smelled of freshly boiled coffee. The place was small and shabby, with a scarred duraplast table and seven molded chairs. Maps covered the walls. A single dirty window in the back opened onto the chain-link fence and the shuttle port beyond, with its crazily piled containers. He knew Shig Mosedek and had seen Yvette Duchesne often enough to know who she was. 
Talina Paris needed no introduction, her large, dark eyes almost glistening with dislike. Trish Monaghan sat perched on a desk, shoved into the room's far corner, her arms crossed under her delightfully shaped breasts. He might have been walking fungus, given the way she looked at him. He grinned at her and winked, which brought fire to her green eyes. Unexpected, however, was Cap Taggart's presence, dressed as he was in Quetzal and chamois. Recently dried bloodstains still spotted his sleeves and pants. Of course, it was all over town that he'd either quit or been booted from the Marines. His presence in the room this morning? Good lateral move from one seat of power to another. But then Dan had always thought Taggart was a talented man. Who else could have slipped so quickly into Nandi's bed? All the more reason why he really hated the guy. Very quiet out there on the way over, Dan greeted. Hardly anyone on the streets. And those you see? Not even a greeting called by old friends. Most tense, if you ask me. Must have been quite the set to last night. The town is indeed on edge, Mr. Worth. Shig opened with his placid smile. Have a seat, Yvette offered. Coffee? That would be very nice. Dan settled himself into the round bottom chair and kept his most charming smile in place as he nodded to each of the participants. Well, well, the high and mighty have come to me, he thought. A welling of satisfaction warmed his chest. Oh, father, you miserable prick, if you could only see me now. Trish set a cup of steaming coffee on the table before him, her gaze as inviting as green frost. I heard there were four dead, Dan began. Five, Talina told him, her dark eyes hot enough to sear holes in Cylon. A young man whose arm was shot off died on the cart before we could get him to Raya. And the shooters? Turlon cleared them for transport up to the ship this morning. They'll be gone by midday at the latest, Yvette told him. Then things should settle down? Dan asked mildly. That depends, Shig said easily. Sometimes these events trigger more events, take on a life of their own. Other times, agency can mold the direction, intensity, and duration of such squabbles. Which agency? I haven't seen a door marked Bureau of Public Squabble. Shig's smile irritated the hell out of Dan, as the man said, The Agency of Human Action. Call it the wild card in your poker game. In times of stress, a single person can often unexpectedly influence the outcome of great events. An entire branch of social science has been devoted to its study. Dan kept his smile in place. Shig had just neatly, inoffensively, put him in his place. A most subtle man, this Shig not one to be underestimated. And you've asked me here to become this agent? He spread his hands. Gentlemen, ladies, I have no part in whatever objective Palladoro and Oman are after. Of course you do, Cap told him, right eye narrowed in a deadly squint. See, the thing is, when people are killing each other in the streets, plotting attacks, swearing revenge, not to mention bleeding and dying, they're sure as hell not tossing dice down a craps table. He paused to add, income suffers. Captain, you do make a point. He waited, letting them make the next play. To his surprise, Trish Monaghan said, we know the ringleaders hang out in the jewel. 
You're a skull yourself. Arrived on the Turalon. One of theirs. They feel safe there. That would be my client's personal business. Meddling in the affairs of others, as the good captain noted, leads to a reduction in income. Which leaves you at something of a disadvantage, doesn't it? Yvette asked. If they're rioting, they're not gambling and whoring. And if you were to suggest a different course of action on their part, you're in jeopardy of being accused of meddling and still stand to lose. Not to mention, Shig noted, as your business becomes more and more identified with the disgruntled, fewer and fewer of the rich Donovanians will be willing to patronize your tables. And, as the complaints of the Turlon demonstrators so aptly proclaim, the skulls are, how do I put this, of limited financial means and prospects? It seems you'd want more of the former and fewer of the latter. Dan chuckled. Nice try. They'd expected any answer but that. He leaned forward over his coffee. See, here's the thing. I've got a brand new safe. Big thing. Tyrell Lawson made it. Clever man, that Lawson. He even figured out a way to bolt it to that huge Cylon and steel slab it sits on. It'd take explosives to knock it free, now that the adhesives have set. And what does a safe have to do with anything? Yvette asked him. It's what's in the safe. Dan smiled. Sharp lady like you. I'd expect you'd already have figured out why I brought it up. Surely not because I give a particular shit about Lawson's great work. But there it is. All right, fart sucker, I'll bite. Trish growled. What's in the safe? Yuan. SDRs. Nuggets. Gemstones. He frowned for effect, as if forgetting. Oh, and a whole folder full of deeds for lots, domes, and businesses. He held up a hand. Wait, there's more. Seems to me there's a second folder full of notes. Loans that I've made to several of the town's leading figures. Take Inga, for example. Needed a couple hundred SDRs to pay for a truckload of barley. Something about how her creditors were a little late paying up. Seems that cash has been flowing, but most of the money paid out recently from the corporation has gone to the farmers. Most other folks are in hock up to their asses because they forked over their plunder to pay for town lots, buildings, and pieces of equipment when the supervisor decided to sell. That cash flow hasn't quite balanced out yet. And you get a percentage on these loans that you're making. Yvette filled in. Dan adopted a pained look. Kind of causes me a bit of anxiety. Like, what do I call my place? The Jewel Casino and Bank? Your point? Cap asked. A bit slow, aren't you, Captain? Dan sipped his coffee, meeting the ex-Marine's hard gaze. Let the local politics work out as they will. Any slacking of business because my fellow skulls are upset, frustrated, and angry, or because the shiny leather folk, like you all here, are pissed, is a short-term problem at best, a minor irritation at worst. He was aware of the violence brewing in Officer Paris's black eyes, the thinning of her mouth, he lifted a hand in surrender. Oh, sure. You could apply pressure, threaten, maybe do one of those raid-in-force searches of my place. You know, break up the furniture, looking for... He hooked his fingers like quotation marks. Contraband. A beat. Won't do you any good. Why not? Cap asked. 
because I'd have to repair the damage. That would mean I'd have to call in loans from all over Port Authority. That or seize the businesses, property, or equipment listed as collateral down in the fine print. I have that right in the event of natural disaster or social discord. You piece of shit. Paris hissed through gritted teeth. Hey, officer, I'm just a businessman. Don't vent on me. Take it up with Paladuro and Oman. They're the cause of your current difficulties. Me. I'm just a bystander. Paris started to stand, one hand on her pistol, only to have Shig Mozadek lay gentle fingers on her gun hand. With a feathery touch, he guided her back down to her chair. Still, the glistening and almost alien look in her eyes sent a shiver down into Dan's bones. Fuck, what was it about that woman? She worried him like no other living human being. In an effort to regain his equilibrium, Dan smiled thinly. Now, all that said, I'm not unsympathetic. Really? Yvette tried to keep the scorn from her voice. Really? Dan said mildly. Violence in the streets? How ugly. Property can be damaged, including my own. People killed. That sort of thing can be like a steel splinter driven deep. It festers, and years later it can burst out again. Chig, whose mellow expression had never changed, finally let loose of Paris and said, We have at least one ray of light in all this. The returnees will be off-planet within hours. Your festering splinter, as you call it, will be removed from our flesh. What remains is to ensure that another splinter doesn't find its way into the currently exposed and vulnerable hide of our people. Good point, Shig. So, tell me, what have you got in mind? And how do I profit from it? You profit from... Paris was cut off as Mosadek's restraining hand shot out with amazing rapidity. Glad you can keep her under control, Shig, Dan said solicitously. We'd never get to the point. As Paris turned molten and volcanic, Shig said, We're not without sympathy for the new people. The corporation brought them out here on a promise only to find absolute disappointment. They have nothing, not even a way home, since even their desperation can't overcome their fear or distaste when it comes to spacing back on Touralon. Yeah, they've got better odds betting Red 15 on my roulette wheel. Shig said, We are willing to work with them and we have a great deal more latitude to do so now that Freelander's cargo is piled on the shuttle field. We're willing to deal with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis to meet their needs and minimize the dislocation they are feeling. You've had free reign, Yvette added coldly. It would be a shame if we were to start causing you problems, wouldn't it? Ordinances... Laws, asking for protection money, fines, and fees. God, all fucking mighty, it feels so good to have them on their knees, Dan thought. Dan kept the delight glowing in his breast from showing on his face. Listen, we're all in the same ship here. Now that we've got the chest thumping over with, truly... I'm not unsympathetic. It's my community, right? I need to live in it like all the rest of you. So yeah, I'll help you with your little problem. How? Paris snapped. Hey, officer, down. I'm on your side. 
He kept his lips from twitching, as she, Taggart, and Monaghan seethed behind gritted teeth. Hands raised in mock surrender, he told them, Let me deal with Paladuro and Oman in my own way. Give me a week to get everything under control. I know these people, spaced with them for two years. He paused, looked at Mosadek suggestively. You got an inventory for Freelander's cargo? Unfortunately, no. The ship's records were destroyed. Yvette told him. Turlon's crew just unloaded the hold, piled it all akimbo on the field outside the fence. Why would you care if there were an inventory? Cap Taggart almost spat the question. Because there's equipment there that can help the transition for some of the soft meat. Dan told them reasonably. Take poor old Pete Morgan. He's absolutely terrified to space back on Tourlon. Figures he's going to be murdered and thrown in the hydroponics like those fools in that bone pile aboard Freelander. A core drill. Not as good as a rotary bit, I'm told. And seismic equipment were supposed to be on Freelander. If it's there, he suddenly got his job back. The corporation thinks there's hydrocarbons in the rock somewhere out in the hinterlands. It's at least hope for them. We can work with that, Shig said. Your help will be deeply appreciated. You will be doing us a huge favor. Favor? Dan gave the man his best and most winning smile. Let's call it a partnership. Shall we? I'm a businessman, after all. Since I'm joining the cabal here, I want a percentage. Nothing big, just compensation for my time. Oh, and a seat at your council meetings. The room went coldly silent. Dan stood, tossed off the last of the coffee. Good stuff you brewed there, Trish. He turned, stepped out, and closed the door behind him. As he nodded at step, Paris was shouting, Toilet-sucking son of a bitch! I'm gonna shoot that pus-sucking maggot in the back! Touchy, aren't they? He asked Alenovich as he started down the hallway, a skip to his stride. Wonder how long it's going to take them to cave, he thought. And if they didn't, there'd be another riot tonight. Something that would bring them to their senses. But it would have to be done carefully. No sense in pissing off the other Donovanians. Chapter 64 Calico sat in the observation dome and stared down at Donovan, where the planet passed slowly below the orbiting Turalon. Swirls and clots of white cloud contrasted with the green-brown patterns and textures on the surface. Mountain ranges crisscrossed the blue-green verdure. To the north, the world turned tan, accented by glaciers and snowfields, as the planet's curvature gave way to the polar region. She could make out the gulf, a round bite out of the gently undulating coast of the continent. From a rim of aqua shoreline, the water immediately darkened to a deep royal blue that matched the ocean's tones to the east. The returnees had been boarded for a couple of hours. Their possessions were stored, and they'd been assigned bunk space in the barracks. Abibi had what was left of her crew conducting the last of the checks. I can go, Calico whispered to herself. Just give the order. The image of her emerging from the Temple of Bones seemed to hang in her memory. If you go back, she whispered in time to the apparition's utterance. Even as she said it, the cold fear ran through her, the nightmares that woke her.
night after night, seemed to loom in the air behind her, an eternity. Locked in these corridors and rooms, ghosts prowling around her ancient and withered corpse as it rotted in some dark recess. I don't want to die that way. How had she come to this? She'd been fearless back in Solar System, willing to tackle any risk despite the probability of her destruction should she fail. She ground her teeth, nodded her fists. What had Donovan and Freelander done to her? She only needed to give the order. One word to Margot Abibi. Space. And she couldn't. If she so much as took a breath in anticipation, the sick curling started in her gut. It might have been the same if a cold pistol muzzle were being pressed against her temple. To have uttered the word would have been to pull the trigger. Ma'am? Abibi's soft voice called from the other side of the pressure hatch. Come in, Calico said softly, refusing to pry her gaze from the planet. They were out over the eastern ocean now, crossing the Terminator, the gulf falling behind toward the sun-bathed horizon. Your calm's off. Lieutenant Spiro was looking for you. She's got seven of her marines in hack. Three, Garcia, Talbot, and Shinsu, are missing. The eight who stood with her had to force the others onto the shuttle just before the last lift. She told me she's going to have to bring charges for insubordination. Shit. Abibi was giving her that calm, brown-eyed stare, as if seeing into her soul. Abibi seemed to hesitate, then took a breath. Something else, ma'am. A delay, I'm afraid. Nothing serious. Just a recalibration of Reactor 6. Figure twelve hours before we can space. I see. I was wondering, ma'am, if you might want to take those Marines. There's the question of Freelander... It should probably be decided. Ownership, I mean. We're spacing. You're leaving that ship in orbit. Mighty tempting for the triumvirate, don't you think? Tempting? Yes, ma'am. Floating around in orbit, like it is. Mosadek and Duchesne might look at it as a prize to be looted. Stripped. You ask me... It wouldn't do to have the next ship to Donovan arrive and find what's left of Freelander to be nothing more than orbiting Hulk. Questions might be asked. Board member Aguila, did you or did you not have a written agreement with the Donovanians that Freelander was corporate property and not to be touched? How would they get to it? They don't have a shuttle. We birthed them all on Freelander. You willing to bet your career on that? That they can't build one? A lot of talent down there. Calico stared thoughtfully at the dark ball of planet below. It's impossible. Spiro said that the people who attacked the returnees figured to eventually take Turalon turn it into a station. Why wouldn't they move on Freelander the moment we spaced? A sudden anxiety grew in Calico's heart. You're right. A reprieve? Perhaps a day? Another chance to ask herself if she was making the correct choice? Just doing what I have to for my ship and crew, ma'am. Calico nodded forcing herself up from the seat. Very well. Prepare the shuttle. Have Spiro assemble her marines. I'll need all of them to make a statement to force, even the ones under disciplinary action. 
Yes, ma'am, Abibi told her, a sympathetic smile on her lips. As the captain followed her out of the dome, she said, I've taken the liberty of having your possessions packed and stowed on the shuttle. Abibi's gaze sharpened, boring into calicoes with the full intent of her message. I'm giving you a way out. Thank you, Captain. The fist that had been tightening around Calico's heart seemed to loosen, and for the first time in days, she realized she could take a deep breath. I have told my people that, pending counter-orders from you, we're ready to space in twelve hours. I'll expect to hear from you sometime within the next twelve hours, in the event you wish to change those orders. Otherwise, I will proceed at my own discretion. Abibi carefully asked, Do you understand? Again, the boring gaze told her, I'm leaving in twelve hours, unless you object. Whatever you think is best, Calico waved her acceptance. The walk down to the shuttle bay might have been on legs filled with helium. Freelander! My God! What could I have been thinking? Way too much on your plate, ma'am. Abibi told her in that crisp voice of command. And then there's the matter of the Freelander cargo. It's still technically yours to do with as you see fit. Calico nodded having no idea what might have been in that gaping hold. Her concern had been getting it down planet. Just a thought, ma'am. But those transportees down there are still under contract. Backed by the Marines, you could still dictate the conditions of their employment. No one on the planet could prohibit your enforcement of the terms. In other words... You've got all the means for success at your disposal down there. That's true, Calico said, swallowing against the curious pounding in her chest. Twelve hours. She had twelve hours before Abibi spaced. All it would take was a call. As they walked into the shuttle bay, Lieutenant Spiro was standing at the hatch, dressed again in battle armor, her helmet hanging, a look of curious relief on her normally doer face. As Calico approached, the lieutenant snapped off a salute, asking, Did the captain speak correctly, ma'am? You wanted the mutineers, too? I mean, I've got them in bonds aboard the shuttle, but we packed in their armor and tech. That was correct, Lieutenant. You may board. Supervisor, Abibi said at the last instant. Calico turned, one foot on the threshold. Yes? We've noticed some problem with the Port Authority radio. Some of their communications come through garbled. Just wanted that stated for the record, ma'am. Again, the message was clear. That's my alibi, if you ever come back and accuse me of abandoning your ass down there. Understood, Captain. Abibi saluted, mouth working as if she were biting off words. Her almost tan eyes reflected a conspiratorial wariness as she said, If there's any change in your plans, I'll hear from you within twelve hours. Good luck, ma'am. As to Turalon, we're the best in space. Don't worry about us. And with that, Abibi spun on her heel and marched back straight for the companionway stairs that led up to officer country. Calico bit her lip, turned, and stepped into the shuttle. Her stomach was no longer acid as she strapped in behind the pilot's seat and closed her eyes. 
Margot Abibi, bless you for the savior that you are. Chapter 65 The tables in the jewel were filled with skulls, and that damned shig had been right. The amounts they were betting was what, in the trade, was called chicken shit. Mostly chump change, hardly an SDR among them. And what they had left was quickly changing to drink instead of wagers. Angelina, as proof of the mark's poverty, prowled without purpose among the tables, dropping a word here, patting a shoulder there, but finding no action. Talk was dark, angry, about the five bodies that had been carted out to the cemetery that morning and dropped into graves that a backhoe had summarily chopped out of the damp red dirt. And, of course, about the returnees who'd skipped justice and now floated safely above in the heavens. My hope, Palladuro sang out loudly enough for half the room to hear, is that they space, vanish, and die like those bastards on Freelander did, slowly, eating each other until the last one is a fucking half-rotted skeleton. Fig had paraded himself around Turalon for two years, bragging about how he was going to set himself up with a hard rock mine. His skill, or so he had claimed, was in his abilities to program mucking machines. That, with his new programs, the machines could sort good ore from waste, identifying minerals and metal content through a sophisticated laser and sonic scan. He might still have a chance to prove himself. The mucking machines were supposedly somewhere in the clutter of Freelander's cargo, where it lay piled out beyond the fence. Assuming, that is, that he wanted to give up his newfound status as one of the protest leaders. Somehow, Dan just couldn't see Paladuro surrendering a top spot in the fiery movement that earned him free drinks, accolades, and slaps on the back. What was that compared to the joy of sitting in a dark hole, watching a clunking mechanical marvel sort rocks? Oman, Fig's companion in mayhem, sat across the table, his eyes distant, cards forgotten in his hand. The man had that stunned look on his face. He'd been one of the loudest in calling for the raid on the returnees. That it had gone so badly, that men had died, seemed to have taken something out of him. Yeah, Dan whispered, dealing himself four out of the five cards needed for a club flush. How had he managed to screw up and get a diamond in there? Tough call last night, Oman. It could be tougher for the both of them if the triumvirate came through. As if on cue, Cap Taggart stepped through the door, paused, and took in his surroundings as his eyes adjusted from the sunset glare outside. Well, well, Dan whispered to himself and slipped the pistol from his belt and into the wire holder he'd rigged to the underside of the table. Smiling, he stood, spreading his hands. Welcome to my humble world, Captain. I'm so glad you could wiggle a little time free from your busy schedule. You here for a game? Or by chance have you come bearing word on my proposition? Taggart prowled his way across the room, looking side to side, seeming to see everything one hand on the military-grade pistol at his hip. The Quetzal hide jacket he wore glimmered in rainbow patterns as it passed beneath the lights. Have a seat, Dan told him with a smile. Allison, oh love of my life, he boomed. Bring us a couple of glasses. Oh, and that brandy Inga's so proud of. 
Taggart hesitated, his cold, blue-eyed gaze still skipping around the room, as if wary of an ambush. Paladuro and Oman were frozen, expressions hard as they stared icily at Taggart. Heedless, Dan dropped back into his chair, hands still spread inoffensively wide. Oh, come, Captain. Even if Shig and Yvette bowed to Security Officer Paris's adamant objections and told you to come spit in my eye, you don't think I'd be foolish enough to take it out on you? Allison appeared, a saucy sway to her hips, glasses and bottle in her hand. Taggart eased himself down into the chair. There, Dan said easily as Allison set the glasses down and poured. Not so hard, was it? Taggart watched Allison's retreat as she headed back to the cage, her walk accented to display the rounded curves of her ass. That was Allison, fully aware that every male eye in the place followed her. Who would have thought an angel like that would be waiting on a rock like Donovan? Dan said with a sigh. He took up his glass. To opportunity. He raised it in a toast. Taggart, his stare still glacial, studied him for a couple of heartbeats, then lifted his glass, saying, Whatever that means, and tossed it off. Dan drank, smacked the glass down, and sighed. Not bad, don't you think? Of all the things I was told to expect, fine drink wasn't on the list for Donovan. Looks to me like you've found more than brandy on Donovan. Hard to believe they sent me here to take care of cows, huh? Yes, who'd have thought? If it hadn't been for that little incident with Nandi, I wouldn't even have known you were aboard. You camouflage better than a Quetzal. Dan's heart skipped. Nandi? A lying slit. Oh, to have savored her throat crushing under his fingers. To have watched the terror in her eyes fade, her pupils widen as her heartbeat slowed. You haven't done so badly yourself, Captain. We both know Nandi's charms. But what's it like? Cycle down planet, slip out of Nandi's bed, and into Talina Paris's. He raised his hands defensively. Not that I'm complaining. I know firsthand how much of an improvement Allison made in my life. So I sure don't hold it against you for doing the same. He winked. I like the wilder action myself. Taggart's jaw muscles bunched, jumped, his eyes narrowing into frigid slits. After the things Nandi told me about you, I'm surprised you had the courage to try and get it up with another woman. A chill wave ran through Dan's bones and nerves. He felt the rage, hot and red stirred down in his gut. It burned, went white hot along his spine. Then that part of him went blank, his heart slowing, a crystalline clarity sharpening his senses. As he twirled the brandy glass with a distracting left hand, his right slipped below the table to the pistol grip. Did you have a purpose for coming here today? Or are you simply tired of life? You and I, we teeter on the balance right now. Clairvoyant, are you? Captain, I foresee a very short and bitter future for you. Don't push it further. Now, do you have a message for me? You have a deal. There's a message from Triumvirate. God help them. So there it is. You've been told. Dan's finger slipped along the trigger, 
tension building. His heartbeat slowed to a steady, emotionless beat. Not now, you fool. Not here. Dan smiled, removed his hand, and waved. I want you out of my establishment. Taggart stood, a thin smile on his lips, promise in his eyes. Just so we're clear. Your deal is with Shig, Yvette, and Talina. Me? I'm my own man. So I wouldn't disappoint them if I were you. Right now, they're all you've got. Dan had to give the fool credit. He was smart enough to back away from the table, one hand on his pistol. Nor did he take his eyes from Dan's, using peripheral vision to make his way to the door and out into the dying light. You're a dead man, Captain Taggart. And more than that, I know where you live. He winced as he imagined the lies that had spun out of Nandi's lips. Well, Turalon hadn't spaced yet. Perhaps there was a way to settle with her, too. After all, one of the first things he'd managed to do was to cultivate the talents necessary to handle the more distasteful projects. Art, he called. If I could have a word back in the cage. He slipped his pistol back through his belt, stood, and met Art Mannequin at the cage door. What have you got, boss? Art's normally emotionless eyes quickened as he followed Dan into the office's privacy. A job, Art. About as delicate a job as I could ask a man to do. It'll take judgment, finesse. And when you're done, nothing. And I repeat, nothing can be traced back to us. Do you understand? Art grinned, exposing a cracked incisor. Oh, yes. The man lived for assignments like this. Chapter 66 The whine of heavy equipment, the hollow bangs of the grapples, and the straining of hydraulics came from the jumbled piles of crates and containers. Skid loaders labored to make sense out of the piled mess that had been haphazardly dropped on the landing field margins. Pamlico Jones and his crew of six had made some semblance of order out of the tangle of equipment, air cars, bundles of struts, beams, tarping, haulers, excavators, and odd-looking rigs whose purpose Tolina couldn't guess. In lockstep, she and Trish marched out past the man gate and onto the shuttle field. They were still days from getting it all sorted, let alone opened and inspected, to make a determination of what was salvageable and what was junk. Some of the bigger pieces of equipment had been towed through town to the maintenance sheds. A couple of the excavators and loaders had actually taken a charge and ran on their own power at least for a ways. The crates and containers, however, would each have to be opened to figure out what they held, laboriously inventoried and routed to the proper storage. Assuming people didn't all kill each other first. Port Authority might have been a pressure cooker. Bad enough that the skulls were still stewing. Worse, that Shig and Yvette had outvoted her when it came to that slug-in-the-mud worth. Now here she was, right at sunset, watching the silver delta of a shuttle winging in from over the gulf, its shriek as threatening as a Quetzal's. What the hell does the supervisor want now? Trouble. No doubt about it. Talina laced her fingers around her pistol grip, 
the contours formed to her hand, reassuring, firmly filling her palm. Shit in a toilet. I want to shoot someone, she growled. Worse, it had been Cap who'd volunteered to take the one-word answer to Worth. Deal. As a result, it had fallen to Talina and Trish to meet Aguila's shuttle as it came in. Do you just want her stepping off alone? Shig had asked when she met him in his office earlier. Getting into who knows what kind of nonsense? No, but what does she want? Two spots just said she needed to speak to the three of us. Better that Yvette and I prepare ourselves to look at least moderately professional and in control, especially if this has anything to do with the attack on the returnees. Who knows what they might have told her about last night? We could have used the radio. Trish had growled, sent her a message. We've got it under control. Now space your ass out of here, and don't come back. Shig's smile had beamed as he said, Trish, the fine art of diplomacy has never seen the like of your poise, grace, or wit. Thank God, Yvette had murmured. The distant sound of thrusters could be heard as they ripped through the air. Talina stared out at the bush, wondering where the Quetzal had gone. The one seen the first day, when the corporation had roared back into their lives. The beast in her belly seemed to settle smugly under her heart. And I haven't forgotten your game, either, she told the creature. Molecules, huh? What was that? Trish asked, arms crossed, her pistol grip sticking out suggestively. Wind teased her auburn hair. Just talking to my Quetzal, Talina quipped. You worry me sometimes. Here comes the dust. The shuttle backed air, rotated into the wind, and touched onto the seared clay. As the thrusters spooled down, the struts compressed. The sleek craft rocked like a raptor settling into a nest. Pamlico's crew had stopped their reshuffling of crates to watch and now went back to grappling and reorganizing a series of haphazardly stacked containers. You sure would have thought the vaunted corporation would have done a better job unloading that stuff, Trish noted. It's like they tossed shit wherever they could. Ghost ship, remember? Talina asked. They wanted it the hell off Freelander so they could either desert or scurry back to Turalon, where the lords of Shibalba wouldn't get them. The lords of who? Shibalba, the Mayan underworld, where the lords of the dead and monsters live. It's an old story among my mother's people back in Chiapas. But this is Donovan. Where everything is different, Talina agreed. That's why our underworld, full of the haunted dead, is now up in the sky. A cruel sort of inverted symmetry, don't you think? The ramp dropped as the shuttle thrusters whine thinned into silence. Talina started forward, hand on her pistol, as the apparently requisite marines trotted down to take up position. They'd no more than hit dirt before Supervisor Aguila dressed in a black, form-fitting, one-piece suit, followed. Apparently, she'd learned. This time, her thick wealth of black hair had been pulled back and clipped. Her shoes were also eminently more practical. Talina tried to read the woman's expression as she approached. Aguila's lips were pursed, hands behind her back. This time, she was looking around, as if really seeing the planet. The way she walked, the slow swinging of her feet, communicated hesitation, perhaps relief. Her attention fixed on Pamlico's crew, 
where they used a forklift to back a crate out of a mess of containers that reminded Talina of jumbled children's blocks. Then the woman fixed on Talina, a smile that spoke of inevitability bending her lips. Security Officer Paris, she greeted, and her loyal sidekick, Trish Monaghan. Of course they'd send you. Shig thought a band and a parade would be a little over the top. How can we help you, Supervisor? A few last details need to be worked out. Shouldn't take more than a couple of... Talina! They turned at the frantic shout from across the field. Pamlico Jones was standing on the forklift seat, waving as he called. You better come see this. We got trouble, and it ain't good. Now what? Trish grumbled. Excuse us, Talina said. No, we'll all go. See what sort of trouble you have now. Aguila almost laughed. I could use the amusement. Side by side, Talina and Trish led the way. Aguila and her marines followed in formation. And to make the joke complete, who would have guessed that the supervisor and her security acted as their own little parade? Jones had climbed down from the humming forklift. He and his three helpers stood in a knot where they just pulled a room-sized Cylon container back. What you got, Pam? Talina asked, and stopped to study the recessed area surrounded by the crates. Thought this was funny-looking, Pamlico said, gesturing. They'd left a container on top, sort of like a cap, you know? Then we pulled this one out of the way, and here's this space all left behind it. And, well, see? See, she did. The Quetzal inside her hissed its excitement. Stepping forward, hand on her pistol, Talina took it all in. The containers had been placed to create a sheltered enclosure, bounded on all sides, with narrow gaps that allowed ingress and egress. A tarp had been tied up as a rain fly to shelter bedding where four people had slept. Plates, pans, ration kits, and personal items were strewn around, proof that they'd been there for a while. She caught the smell at the same time she recognized the mounded excrement. The Quetzal shrilled victoriously inside her. What looked like soiled rags told the rest of the story. Scattered about, torn, they were the remnants of coveralls. And there was a boot, another there, and another, and another. Trish, she warned. Yeah? Trish had already pulled her pistol, backing against Talina, eyes scanning the container tops. What's going on here? Aguila asked. What is all this? Spiro? Talina shouted. Weapons at the ready and hot. We got a Quetzal. Fuck and shit. Pamlico and his crew scrambled for the rather insubstantial safety of the forklift's cab. Tal, we're out of here. Go, Pam. Into her calm, Talina snapped. Two spots? We've got a Quetzal kill on the shuttle field. She stepped warily over, flipped a piece of the torn coveralls with a toe, and counted. Looks like four people. Four? Two Spot's voice answered. Roger that. Damn. Tell me what's going on, Aguila ordered, but her voice had taken on a different tone. She was now staring over Lieutenant Spiro's shoulder, an uneasy frown marring her forehead. Talina carefully stepped into the enclosure, pistol ready, and bent down. She turned over a crumpled wad of coveralls, to expose a sleeve and breast patch. Load, specialist. See the Turalon patch? 
You know the uniform as well as I do, Supervisor. Four of them. My guess? They didn't want to take a chance on spacing back on Turalon. Instead, they figured they could make a nice little shelter here, wait it out until you were all gone. Then they could walk out and make new lives. Deserters, Spiro growled from behind her shining helmet. What happened to them? What is all this? Quetzal, Trish growled. The damn fools even left a doorway for it. She pointed to the gap in the back, facing away as it did from the landing field. Been here for days, Talina noted as she studied the claw-scuffed dirt, the piles of excrement. It would have killed all four immediately. Then it ripped the clothing from the bodies and laid them out, eating them bit by bit, piece by piece. Inside her, the Quetzal hissed in agreement, the thing irritatingly joyous. Trish pointed at the heaping mounds of dung, and there's what's left of your crew members, Supervisor. To Talina, she asked, What next? The Marines were staring through their visors, faces grim as they fingered their weapons. Aguila's back had stiffened, distaste on her fine features. She asked, Is it still around? No, Talina guessed, feeling the Quetzal's agreement. My guess is that it only stayed long enough to feed. But, my God, four people? Eating them would have taken days. So why take the chance it might be discovered? One thing's sure, Trish noted warily. It's energized. Call it supercharged. Talina backed out of the shelter, turning, running her eyes over the stacks of crates, the parked equipment, a thousand places to hide. And then Talina fixed on the Port Authority gate, swung wide, open, inviting. Oh, fuck. The Quetzal under her heart hissed in victory. Talina accessed her calm. Two spots? We've got a Quetzal inside the compound. Sound the alarm. We need lockdown, now. Inside the compound? Trish cried, spinning around to stare at the gate in horror. At that moment, the warning siren began to wail, its ugly bellow carrying through the early evening air. Let's go, people, Talina called. Spiro, you tell that shuttle to button up, and no one steps out until this is over. Get Aguila into the admin dome and secure. After that, I need you and your team to help in the hunt. To Talina's surprise, Calico Aguila could actually run, and run well. What's this thing doing? Aguila asked as she panted along in the midst of her marines. It's eaten. Why enter Port Authority? It's got to know we're going to find it. Kill it. Got me, Supervisor. But whatever it's planning, it ain't going to be good. Talina thought her Quetzal was laughing as it slithered around inside. Chapter 67 The way Cap felt, he could have used a shower. Something about Dan Worth just left him feeling unclean. That old sixth sense made him glance back over his shoulder at Worth's warehouse-turned-casino. Not a single soul was in sight. No party of thugs were emerging to follow along in his wake. Still, Cap couldn't shake the feeling that he and Worth had crossed some unseen line that would destroy one or both of them. What is it about that guy? He glanced at the sunset as he heard the distant roar of a shuttle approaching. The slanting light illuminated the underside of high clouds, a bank of them that glowed pinkish-orange in the light. Their texture and color, given the ripples and lines, 
reminded him of a thinly sliced fillet of salmon. Around him, Port Authority was still quiet in the aftermath of the night's violence. People were wary, giving him a nod of the head at best, but none of the usual cold greetings as he passed the domes and stone buildings with heavy chibacha wood doors. Uncharacteristically, the streets were cluttered with occasional crates and containers. The odd vehicle dragged in from the treasure trove of Freelander's holds lay awaiting attention. I tell you, Cap, the guy's a psycho. That night, he didn't have any more feeling in him than a block of ice. I wasn't any more important to him than a fly on the wall. Nandi's voice echoed in his memory. A psycho? Impossible. Cap had pulled Dan Worth's profile from the ship's records. The guy had worked for one of the big corporate farms in the North American Midwest. His entire life history was there. Never a speck of trouble. Not so much as a complaint. Psychopaths always had something in the records. Allegations, charges some sort of incident report, even if they'd never been convicted. Besides, Dan Worth, like all the transportees, had to have passed the psychiatric evaluations and assessment of functioning. Granted, he'd been late, almost missed the last shuttle up to Turalon, but nothing else was outstanding. How could they have missed him? It wasn't impossible that a clever psychopath could trick the general assessment of function test, but it was rare enough that people considered the system solid. The Dan Worth he'd just dealt with wasn't an easygoing cattle technician from a Midwest feedlot. This was a stone-cold killer. Nandi had called it right. Good thing you had that pistol under your pillow, girl. So, what did Shig and Yvette have under theirs? Talina wouldn't hesitate. She'd shoot the son of a bitch if he threatened her. And don't tell me that Worth doesn't know that. He stopped, watching as the shuttle swooped in and dropped on the other side of town. When the roar died, he added, So when it comes to Talina, he'll come at her from the shadows. Never give her a chance. What are you going to do about it, Cap? Kill him before he can kill Tal. Odd, wasn't it? How easily he could commit himself to taking a man's life. Donovan had gotten into Cap's blood. Dan Worth was a dead man. Cap hesitated at Inga's glanced behind him again to ensure that he wasn't being followed, and then opened the door and stepped inside. As he looked down into the great room, it was to see Donovanians pretty much on one side, transportees on the other. For the most part, they were ignoring each other. Only the occasional cast glance was spared for either side. Nor was the room particularly loud, but more somber. He trotted down the steps, nodded as the occasional set of eyes turned his way, and stopped at the bar. What'll it be, Cap? Inga asked as she headed his way. He leaned on the wood. How's it been? Any trouble? She shrugged. Not yet. The locals, they're thinking. Damn fools, what kind of idiots, carrying clubs— would charge headlong down a narrow alley into a fight with folks toting guns. The skulls, they're thinking, what kind of heartless bastards would open fire on people armed only with sticks and stones? Should Tal and I drop by later? Wouldn't hurt for our people to see her, Cap. Especially later on tonight. I'm pouring light drinks. Cut off a few like Hofer, who were getting a bit deep in their cups. And I'll keep cutting especially with the troublemakers. That sounds like a smart... The siren, the one he'd only heard in that first day's drill, blared out. The clear tones had an electric effect on the Donovanians. In an instant, 
They were on their feet, cups abandoned, chairs and benches askew, as they pounded up the steps and surged for the door. Inga slapped a hard hand on the counter, bellowing, You skulls! Get the hell home! Lock your damn doors and wait for the all-clear! Now move it! Cap, slow to full understanding, was caught in the rush. It seemed forever before he spilled out into the street as part of the stream of humanity. He had his pistol, but if this was Quetzal trouble, he wanted more. His time in the bush had taught him that. Sure, there were rifles in the admin dome armory, but Tal would want her personal weapon. Turning toward the residential domes, he broke into a run. The soft meat stood out, milling, calling questions, a half-dazed look on their faces. The Donovanians could have been a crack military team as they dropped their bundles and ran. Children, holding hands, called to their fellows, frightened but focused as they hurried toward safety. Cap charged into Tal's block, surprised to find a big front-end loader blocking most of the street in front of her dome. Atop the engine unit, a man was frantically pitching tools into his toolbox. What the hell is this? Cap bellowed. A piece of crap off Freelander, the man bellowed. Took a charge. Thought we could get it at least as far as the shops. This is where it stopped. He leaped down, landing with a thud. Got a solar charger on it. It'll move tomorrow. But it's sunset. I know, the man called back over his shoulder. Get it tomorrow. And then he was gone, vanishing into the thinning crowds as people found their domes and bolted inside. Toilet-sucking moron. Cat muttered to himself as he made his way around the thing. The tires, despite looking new, showed cracks. If they'd really aged one hundred and some years, it was no wonder. Cheng was said to be working on a rubber-like compound that could be cooked from mundo tree leaves. Maybe they could make tires from that. Assuming they could figure out how to replace the flat batteries with ones that would allow the big machines to run for long enough to need the tires in the first place. He stepped around the bucket, a big flat-bottomed scoop that slanted down at an angle from the monstrosity's front like a sharp bulldog jaw. He pounded up Talina's steps, smiling thinly as he remembered the night she'd found him there in the rain, how she'd looked at him, head tilted, the way they'd made love when she'd taken him into her bed. The perfect woman, he soliloquized. I just had to cross half the galaxy to find her. Talk about an ultimate irony. He threw the door back and grabbed Talina's rifle off the rack. Popping the magazine, he checked it, topped off with explosive rounds, as if Tal would have had it any other way. And yes, it was chambered. He set the safety and grounded it butt first. Talina had acquired the second rifle, a handmade bolt-action piece made on Donovan. Not military, but for hunting. It would get the job done if he had time to aim. The box magazine held five rounds. He slipped the bolt back to expose the sixth. Got to count shots. He slung Talina's rifle over his shoulder, lifted the bolt gun to the crook of his arm. A soft scuffle of sound behind him was all the warning he got. The blow caught him behind the ear slamming him forward into the rifle rack. You piece of shit, was the last thought in his head. Chapter 68 Calico Aguila wondered if another person could be squeezed into the conference room. This was what they called the big room in what they more amusingly called the Ops Center. Ask her, and Calico would have said it was one poor attempt at a CIC. A table, upon which a map had been spread, 
filled the center of the ten-by-twenty room. The chairs had been shoved back and stacked against the wall to make room for warm bodies. I've traded terror for horror. She rubbed the back of her arms as she remembered the deserter's camp, the scattered supplies, the torn shreds of clothing. Had the bits of bloody coveralls been the worst part, or had it been the mounded excrement that had once been human beings? And that thing is here? In Port Authority? While we can't be 100% sure, Talina had told her, what we can't be is so much as 1% wrong. Calico tried to huddle out of the way, partially protected by Lieutenant Spiro and three of her marines. Decked out as they were in their armor, it was like having an impervious barrier between her and the world. The rest of Spiro's command were lined up out in the hall, waiting for orders. The suspicious stares she got from the shabbily dressed Donovanians left her oddly off balance and added to the feeling of insecurity. Shig Mozadek leaned over the map. Talina Paris, Trish Monaghan, the big man they called Step, and four others peered down at the way his finger divided Port Authority into districts. Trish, you and your team take the residential section. That's our first concern, especially the children's area. That's where it's most likely to have headed. Tal, you take the warehouse district. If it rode in on a piece of cargo, that's where it would have gone to ground. How long's it been in? Step asked, his face pinched into crags and lines. No idea, Paris told him. From the scat, not longer than a couple of hours. How the hell could it have gotten in? One of the other men, a round-faced young Asian with a mop of black hair, asked. E.G., have you seen how much material we've hauled in? Pamlico Jones asked. I've been running loads through the gate all day. It could have flattened itself on top of a container, turned itself gray, and we could have hauled it into the admin dome and never known. And the big gates have been wide open, Monaghan reminded. Sure, we've had the usual centuries, but with all the coming and goings, Quetzals don't like crowds. And damn it, it's the middle of the day. They just don't act this way. It's not right. Or maybe they do, Yvette said crisply. Quetzals adapt. And now we're going to have to as well. Assuming it's actually in the compound, Shig reminded. We have to believe it is. Any other course would get more people killed. Any questions on areas of responsibility? Paris asked. No? All right, people. We know how to do this. Around the table, heads nodded. Unlike the drills, Shig reminded, you take the safety off before you shoot. You may not get a second chance. Paris turned. Madam Supervisor, can you detail us, your Marines? Their tech, especially their thermal detection gear, could make all the difference. And a Quetzal can't slash its way through armor. Calico hesitated, staring into the woman's hot eyes. This wasn't her problem. Nothing the corporation had to... She heard another part of herself saying, Yes. I've lost my mind, she thought. She slapped a hand to Lieutenant Spiro's armored shoulder. Detail the squads, Lieutenant. One for each of the search areas. Ma'am? Spiro turned, her face quizzical. Her helmet hung from her web gear, her rifle slung. Your security at this time is my first and only. Go on, Lieutenant. That's an order. My security will be better served with this thing dead, and you and your people have the best chance of finding it. Now go. Spiro, still frowning, snapped a salute ordering into her calm. Finnegan, Miso, Abu Sasi, form squads for search and destroy. Optics and thermal on, people. 
Weapons hot upon deployment. Let's find this thing and fry it. A series of Roger Thats could be heard through Spiro's battlecom. Calico stood mutely as her people trooped out behind the Donovanians. Feeling oddly alone and adrift, she continued to rub the backs of her arms as if chilled. Into her calm, Yvette said, Millicent, can someone bring us a pot of coffee from the cafeteria? Then she nodded at some response in her earbud. I suspect it's going to be a long night, Yvette told Calico as she dragged a couple of the chairs out. Have a seat, Supervisor. This happens often? Calico asked. Yvette shrugged. Once every couple of months? Usually it's a false alarm. This probably is too, but it keeps us on our toes. Stepping over to seat herself, Calico stared at the map of Port Authority. To her surprise, it had been hand-drawn. The X marks, checks, and areas highlighted in yellow and light blue made no sense. Shig, apparently reading her mind, stated, This is what we call the Quetzal map. X marks the places we've killed Quetzals before. The light blue indicates areas particularly well-suited for them to hide in. Yellow are the slug zones. Slugs? Creatures that come out when it's muddy. They grasp onto a person's foot, climb up the shoe or boot until they find cloth or skin. Once they pierce through, they burrow into flesh and start eating. Cheng concocted a poison, however, and it seems to be working within the town boundaries. Only two cases this year. The BB was right. Calico shook her head slowly. This is hell. There is no exit. I could still call. Order her to wait, she thought. Across the room, Yvette raised an eyebrow. We'd argue differently. Sure, Donovan's dangerous and constantly trying to kill you. But you want to talk Sartre? Hell's back in solar system, with its algorithms, rules and laws, and corporate control. It's all sterile, everything dictated, running like a perfect machine. And once you've been turned into a part of the machine, that's where you'll spend the rest of your life, like a little gear in the works, without hope or opportunity. Were they idiots? Didn't they get it? It's safe, secure, ordered. The corporation takes care of every need. No one starves. No one gets eaten. You've made humans into ants, or maybe bees. Shig's enigmatic smile returned for the first time that night. Supervisor, it is an old argument. Freedom or security. Our people are free. They have no worries about... Section 2, deploying. The call came in on the radio. Shig and Yvette immediately bent to the map. All debate forgotten. Shig? Tal here. We're starting perimeter check. Everyone's on station. Gate secure. Compound is closed up tight. We've got the drones in the air. Roger that. Keep your eyes open, people, Shig replied. Now we wait, Yvette said, stepping back as a woman in worn coveralls entered with a steaming kitchen pot. Made you a couple of gallons, the cherubic newcomer said, her round face flushed with effort. She flipped a damp strand of hair from her forehead and unhooked a cord strung through the handles of a dozen or so coffee cups. Didn't know how many cups you'd need. If you want more, just holler. Shig beamed at the woman. We appreciate it, Millie. Now, get back to the kitchen and batten down. I'll bring the pot and cups back as soon as we have an all clear. Just get the beastie, will you? 
If it's here, Yvette agreed. After she'd left, Shig said, Good woman, Millie. He stepped out into the hall, only to return seconds later with his and Yvette's personal cups. After handing Yvette's cup to her, to Calico's horror, he dipped his own into the steaming coffee without a thought to sanitation. Unconcerned, he returned his stare to the map. Yvette followed suit. Then, to Calico's amazement, dipped one of the cups Millie had supplied and set it before Calico. You get a rare opportunity for a board member. Tonight you get to be one of us. No Marines, no privilege. Just another scared human being wondering if the monster prowling the streets will come through that door and tear you, me, and Shig apart. Oh, come on! This is the admin dome. Surely you've got security. Armed men at the door. Did she dare drink the coffee? Were she to lift that cup, sip, it would be to cross a line she was unwilling to recognize. No guards, Shig told her. So that thing? There's nothing to keep it from walking in the front door? Into this building, right now. Yvette shot her an inquisitive, green-eyed glance, eyebrow lifting. How's it feel to be as vulnerable as the next person? Calico couldn't help but fix on the door as a quiver ran through her. Yvette smirked. Shig took another drink of his coffee, eyes on the map, as if willing it to produce the Quetzal's location. Supervisor, she's teasing you, trying to get under your skin. If the Quetzal's actually inside the fence, odds are that it won't come here. He shrugged. And the longer we go without hearing of an attack, the more likely our marauding Quetzal's not even inside. Then what? It just gets away? We track it, hunt it down. As long as it's moving, the drones can find it. Yvette narrowed a hostile eye. It killed four people, right under our noses. You think we want one as smart as this one to come back? Don't you ever wonder if it's worth it? The fight, I mean? The constant fear and worry? As she spoke, her hands had knotted. Betrayed by the queasy trembling in her heart, Turalon was still an option. Shig, to her dismay, noticed. The man smiled, his voice oddly kind. Supervisor, just how do you think the universe was created to function? You know it deep in your heart. You are a walking contradiction of the very things you claim to believe and promote. Safety, order, security, harmony. Yet here you are, brought to this point by your insatiable need to compete and prove yourself better than the rest. As if you had any idea about what brought me here, Save your psychoanalysis for one of the local lunatics. Shig spread his hands, expression mild. Why do you fail to recognize in yourself what you condemn in others? You wanted a chance at winning it all, a shot at becoming chairman of the board and being the most powerful woman in solar system. You could no more have turned your back on that, acquiesced, to remain a minor functionary in the corporate system, then one of us could walk away from a chance to kill this Quetzal. The corporation keeps the people from destroying themselves. She told him as the corporate mantra sprang reflexively from her lips. Ah, the people. Poor benighted fools. No sense in giving them 
the same opportunity that you and the tiny percentage of the wealthy and powerful possess. If it's so bad, why have we eliminated poverty, unemployment, ensured that no one goes hungry? You ask me, we've made a hell of an improvement in everyone's lives. Peace, prosperity, the quality of human life has never been better. Shig seemed to beam understanding. Tell me, would you trade places with a single one of the people? And if so, tell me which one. Name a name, state an occupation, a place of residence. Which one of the worker bees would you become? She stared at him, refusing to rise to the bait. Yvette took a swig of her coffee and said, Of course you wouldn't. You're a fart-sucking hypocrite. You don't understand. Calico realized as she said it that it was an admission of defeat. It's all right, Supervisor, Shig told her. You see, the only real difference between yourself and most of us is that in Solar System, you're the tiny minority. Here, on Donovan, you're just one of a majority. He paused. When you think about it that way, it would seem that you've come home. Come to a place where you're suddenly surrounded by your own kind. She grimaced, fuming at the notion that these barbarians in their hide clothes had anything in common with her. There wasn't a single chance in hell that she'd touch that cup of coffee before her. No matter how wonderful it smelled, or how long the night turned out to be. Home? In a pig's eye. Chapter 69 Patches of cloud left dark spots across the starry sky in the west. Out over the gulf, the clouds had taken on a faint rime of silver, where Donovan's moon was about to rise. If Trish had ever been thankful for Tech, this was the night. She followed Katsuro Miso as the Marine scanned the dark shadows between two residential domes with his superior gear. He was getting a complete heads-up sensor analysis of combined motion detectors, infrared, thermal, and ultraviolet. Trish and her people only had night vision drones and thermal scopes on their rifles and an occasional IR headset. The rest had to rely on flashlights. Over the years, they'd worked out the methodology for the search. The sweep for each block had been practiced until it was second nature, as was the best way to approach each potential hiding place. Trial and error had taught them where to leave an observer so that a hunted Quetzal couldn't double back into a secured area. That knowledge and expertise had been paid for with blood. Now Trisha's team worked through the remaining residential blocks bounded by the curve of the fence. This was mostly filled with transportees, and they kept spilling out into the street as young Benj Martin trotted from door to door to do his headcount. Trish continually had to order the skulls back inside when the curious fools wanted to tag along and watch the hunt. One thing was sure, it made the headcount easier. But the training they'd received, the no-nonsense instruction that when a Quetzal was in the compound, no one opened a door unless at a search team's knock and call, sure hadn't taken... Private, Trish called to Katsuro as they rounded the dome. You're about to see a storage shed appear on your left. There's an awning and a storage area that will be shadowed. The shed's too small for a Quetzal, but we killed one that hunkered down back in the shadows under that awning. Roger that, Katsuro replied as his gear illuminated the shed. 
Together they stepped wide around the building. Weapons up. Katsuro called. It's clear. Trish instinctively swept the area with her scope. Somehow unable to trust Katsuro's sophisticated detectors. People who hunted Quetzals wished they had eyes in the back of their heads. Lucky Marines. They did. Here's Thompson and Hofer, Katsuro told her with a slight gesture down the alley. Sure enough, another Marine appeared in the narrow confines. Behind him, Hofer called, We're all clear here. Next block, Trish called. Watch your back, Hofer. Watch yours. Trish led the way back around the dome to where they'd left Smith kneeling in the intersection, his rifle up, eye to his thermal scope, as he ensured no Quetzal could double around behind him. E.G.'s team appeared, right on schedule, the next block down. I've got visual on you, Trish. E.G.'s soft voice spoke in her earbud. Roger that. Got you, too. See you at the next block. Watch your back. Watch yours. They started down the street, warily approached an air car resting atop a wagon. The inoperative vehicle had been hauled in from the landing field. They carefully cleared it. Makes it tougher with all this Freelander crap, Trish groused. Most of it doesn't work, Katsuro told her. Wouldn't it be better to pilot in a ditch somewhere? Oh, ye of little faith, Private. You're on Donovan now. We reuse everything. Even condoms? Okay, so we reuse almost everything. She grinned as she stared through her scope at the shadowed angle, where an addition had been built onto one of the domes. A produce wagon stacked with empty crates lurked there. No Quetzal. So, Trish, you're one of the officers, right? You pretty much know everything that goes on. Yeah, probably. Trish shifted her rifle, muscles sending the first signals of incipient fatigue. You heard about Talbot, Shinsu, and Garcia? Who? Marines. Three of them and their tactical kit. Did your bosses give them sanctuary? Not that I've heard of. And if three Marines with armor and kit had deserted, it would have been the talk of the town. Why? You missing three? Yeah. Katsuro sounded depressed as he stepped into a gap between buildings, scanned it, and saw Hofer's team appear on the other side. They were pretty pissed that Cap resigned. The rest of us, we were just wondering... You're not telling me everything. Cap leaving? It was like a kick in the teeth. All that talk he used to spout about the core and tradition, of duty and honor and pride and service, and then he vanishes into the bush, and when he comes back, he just walks away. I mean, most of us. We believed in him. Maybe he found himself. Some say it was Paris's fault, that she took him out there specifically to brainwash him and turn him against us. Trish burst out laughing. Not hardly. Taggart arrested Talina in her own home. She barely tolerated the guy. The only reason she took him that day was because it was supposed to be a quick trip. Wasn't anyone as surprised as the rest of us when they came back holding hands and the notion of the two of them still left Trish feeling sour. Things with Talina just hadn't been the same. Trish ran her thermal scope over the shadows behind the Han Chao dome. A pile of toys lay where they'd been dropped by the kids when the siren went off. So, what happened out there? Donovan happened. I guess Cap had more to him than any of us would have thought. Spiro hates him. Why? 
Trish could halfway wish she had Talina's Quetzal sense as she advanced slowly down the street. She could hear the kid in charge of the head count as he knocked on doors behind her. He was everything she aspired to as a commander, kind of a hero worship, because he'd been in the shit so many times. You ask me, she was a bit in love with him. Hit her hard when he left. He paused, then added, Cap kept a leash on her. Most of us don't trust her. She plays favorites, and she carries a grudge that turns into pure poison. Glad she's your problem and not mine. Trish, you sure Talbot, Shinsu, and Garcia didn't desert? Like I said, I'd have heard. Trish sensed his unease. Why? Something fishy about it. I mean, those guys didn't like Cap to start with. Marine's bitch. But they were the ones who griped the most about Cap and his command style. You know, they always found fault. Said they could have done it better. Then they vanish? And Spiro says the supervisor wishes Cap was dead. So when we get the order to space, we're missing three guys, right? We tell Spiro we're not going. She and her people pull weapons on us, and two guys we think are with us side with her at the last instant. So we ride up to Turalon in cuffs, wishing to hell we'd run when we could. Then we're pulled out of the can and shuttled back down here. So, the question is, what are we really here to do? Trish nerved herself. Three of the domes came together here. They'd killed a Quetzal in the shadowy recesses beneath the sunshade that had been stretched between them. For the moment, hunt a Quetzal. And thank God you're here with your tech. You don't know how much faster this is working. She stepped around the curve of a dome, rifle up to scan the alley. A second later, Hofer's team appeared at the other end. Speculation was that Spiro sent Shinsu, Garcia, and Talbot to kill Cap Taggart. I mean, that's what made us refuse orders. Cap may have let us all down, but he didn't deserve that kind of shit, especially after that fight with the returnees. Cap broke it up, while Spiro just stood there like a stone. A cold rush went down Trish's back. You serious? Maybe. Did the supervisor order it? She hates Cap. No secret there. Did Spiro order it? Was it even an order? That's part of the problem. Me and my mates, we don't know what to think anymore. Since we set foot on Donovan, everything's turned upside down. We don't trust the supervisor. We don't trust Spiro. So, Trish hesitated. You refused orders? You think we want a space on that bucket? When we could stay here? Then you better bless this Quetzal after we kill it. Because you've come to the right person. You and your mates get free of Spiro and her backers. We'll get you out of sight until Turalon spaces. Katsuro didn't answer as he scanned the shadows. In her calm, Trish said, Last block, people. Be double sharp. If we've been driving it, it's gone to ground here. She and Katsuro waited while Smith closed up. Behind her, Benj knocked on the last door. To her left, she could see Hofer's team where the street met the perimeter fence. On her right, Step Alanovich's team was closing their search grid, having reached the next intersection. All right, people, Trish said. Let's finish this. Heart in throat, she started forward, muscles somehow recharged. If the Quetzal was here, they'd have it in the next couple of minutes. But they didn't. After searching shadows, scanning rooftops, and looking into recesses, they cleared the last buildings, 
only to stare at the perimeter fence with its motion detectors beyond. Talina's voice came through the calm. All right, people, good job. Looks like the hunt goes outside tomorrow morning. We'll cut for tracks and run this shit sucker down. Shig, sound the secondary. A short blast of the horn was followed a second later by another. Everyone in Port Authority would be breathing easier, but still on alert. People knew full well that even as good as the teams were, they still might have missed something. Benj Martin, a lad in his teens, trotted up with a tablet in his hands. Hey, Trish, I got the head count, knocked on every door. Got an answer on everyone but Talina's, so I opened the door and checked. Both of her rifles are missing, so Cap must have gone off to join her. Good work. Thanks, Benj. Trish took a deep breath, lowered her rifle, and massaged her biceps. Where the hell is Cap? She thought. Damn it. She really didn't like the guy. Cap's presence made everything different, especially between her and Talina. You serious about making a place for us? Katsuro asked. She glanced out beyond the fence. Damn straight. We'll make a place for you. Starting tomorrow when we try and find the killer's tracks. Sounds like fun. Promise you one thing, Private. You'll never be bored. He paused, shifting uneasily. Before we go back, I need to find Cap. Give him a heads up about Spiro, Garcia, Shinsu, and Talbot. Sure. We'll work our way back to the admin dome. Check and see if he's with Tal. If not, most of the search team heads for Ingus. Probably find him there. Hope he's okay. Yeah, me too. Because if you're right, and either the supervisor or Lieutenant Spiro did him harm, Talina will kill them. And then we're really gonna have a bloodbath. Chapter 70 Talina led the way, passing from one pool of light to another along Port Authority's main avenue. In retrospect, she wondered if her reliance on the Quetzal inside her was a good thing. She'd have depended on it expecting at any moment that it would warn her if she were about to stumble onto the intruder. You've got to be damn careful, Tal. Time to turn to her next problem. Her search team, composed of four locals and three marines, including Lieutenant Spiro, walked with slung weapons. The lieutenant had barely spoken. Her presence almost a hindrance in spite of the battle tech that should have enhanced the search. Talina took a deep breath, exhaling to the night as the first sliver of the half-moon crested the eastern horizon. Lieutenant, she asked, do we have a problem? Excuse me? You don't have to like me, and I don't have to like you, but a modicum of civility might ensure that we can at least cooperate on joint areas of concern. Tal gifted the woman with a sidelong glance, trying to read her features in the lamplight. Spiro's blocky face was taut with distaste. Security officer, I've got nothing to say to you past what I'm forced to because of duty. So how about you shut your conniving yap, and your future will be both longer and less painful. Behind her, Tal's people gasped and responded by unslinging their rifles and swinging them around. The Marines shifted, unslinging their own weapons. Spiro seemed unaware. I've never done anything to you. Yeah, right. Now shut the fuck up, bitch. The Quetzal in Talina's gut reacted to the harder beat of her heart, the cold anger under her breast. She forced herself to keep her rifle slung, but her hand dropped to her pistol butt. Careful, Tal, she told herself, 
Something about this isn't right. She's pushing you, spoiling for a fight. With her other hand, she gestured for her people to stand down. I don't know why you're pushing, Lieutenant, but no matter what you've heard about me, I'm not playing your game tonight. You got a problem with me, you come tell me when we're not up to our asses in a situation. That suit you? Better you and that traitorous piece of shit you're screwing can know. Ah, I see. She glanced over her shoulder at the Marines as they walked under the next light. They looked nervous. Folks move on with their lives, Lieutenant. Allowing your personal problems to affect your ability to command isn't just unprofessional. It'll get people killed. To the Marines, she called... Keep an eye on her, people. Spiro halted, hands slapping her rifle as she turned. I ought to shoot you down right here, right now, you lying slit. Tal raised her hands. Like I said, we get the current situation solved and brought to a conclusion. I'm yours. But for the moment, I need you to act like an officer of the Marines, instead of a jilted schoolgirl. So buck up to the task at hand. Can you do that? As a professional, worthy of your people's respect? Spiro's lips twitched, her eyes like dark pools in the shadowed light cast by the overhead lamp. So help me, you and that shit-ass are... Lieutenant! The Marine called Abu Sasi asked, Are we still on duty? Spiro ground her teeth. On duty, Private. Just one question for the civilian. Where's Talbot, Shinsu, and Garcia? Did you and Mr. Taggart add them to your little mutiny plot? Or did you take a more severe measure? Tal cocked her head. The Quetzal bunched in her gut. Her muscles were charged, her vision so fine it read the heat in Spiro's cheeks. Never heard of them, but I'm guessing they're some of your Marines. I'll tell you straight, I don't have a clue as to where they are. And I give you my word, if they've deserted, they didn't come through Port Authority, to my knowledge. Your word is as worthless as shit in a toilet, Paris. Spiro turned, stalking off at a fast pace. Tal? Mgumby asked as he fingered his rifle, eyes slitted. Stand down. As she started forward, she asked the Marine, Abu Sasi, What's this all about? Why is she chewing on my ass trying to get me to kill her? The Marine glanced at his fellows. She's ragging on you because it's all falling apart. We're falling apart, turning on each other. Gotta blame someone. And you started it when you ran off with Cap and made him... Made him? She asked when he couldn't finish. She thinks I stole Cap and seduced him away from his duty? She laughed aloud and slapped her thigh. Oh, God, Private... That's about the most ironic joke you could tell. When we went down, my first instinct was to cut his throat, rather than have him slow me down in the bush. She laughed again. Me? Seduce him? The man was going to have me shot, if you'll recall. Mgumby and the others were laughing, and he called. Trust me, Private. Talina Perez isn't the kind to seduce anyone. Crack him in the head, maybe. Abu Sasi glanced at his fellows, then at the lieutenant, who was now fifty meters ahead and making distance. You told the truth about Garcia, Shin, and Talbot? Private, what your people do is their business. Shig, Yvette, me, Mgumbi, and Montoya here, we could care less. But I'd have heard about Marines trying to desert. Believe me. Again, the Marines glanced back and forth before Abu Sasi asked, So you and Cap 
didn't hatch any plan to talk us into deserting? Nope. Might not have been a bad idea, but we've had our asses busy trying to keep your people from killing each other, and we're still not sure that's taken care of. She fucking lied. Private Andershoni muttered. I still think she sent Shin, Talbot, and Garcia after the captain. Want to explain that? Talina asked as they rounded the corner before the admin dome. Spiro had disappeared into the building. Nothing we know. Just a suspicion, Abu Sasi said, slowing to a stop. Some of us wonder if the supervisor might have ordered Spiro to put the captain down. You know, as an example to the rest of us. For Miso and some of us, that cut the cord. Talina cursed, accessing her calm. Shake, Trish, step. Anybody seen Cap Taggart? Anyone know where he is? She listened, as one by one they checked in with negatives. I heard he was at Inga's just before the siren went off. Lawson told her, haven't seen him since. Talina's lungs seemed starved. Ngumbe, get everyone back to the dome. Tell the rest I'll be there as soon as I find Cap. She turned, unslung the rifle, and ran. At Inga's, she slammed through the door, trotted down the steps, and scanned the faces. Hey, any of you assholes seen Cap? Nope. Not since the siren. Figured he was with you. A chorus of rejoinders and shaking heads came in reply. Turning, she took the stairs two at a time. Out in the night, she paused, glanced up at the half-moon. Where would you have gone, Cap? He was still a skull. Wouldn't have known the first place she would have gone was to the admin dome. Home? she wondered. Unlike her, he would have thought of the rifles, wouldn't have known that she'd pull one from the armory rack rather than take the time to fetch her own. Talina took off at a sprint, her heart hammering. That was Trisha's section to clear. She'd have had someone dedicated to the head count, knocking on doors. If Cap was there, he would have answered, asked what the hell was up. Bullshit. Cap would have come to help. Sitting at home through an emergency wasn't his style. The Quetzal twisted around inside her, agitated, almost electric. You piece of shit, she muttered to the beast. This is Cap we're talking about. Soon now. Both. She ground her jaws, panting as she charged through the night, rounded the corner to her street, and saw the big loader with its tilted bucket in front of her house. If she needed to get the cart in, had to rescue Cap, the thing was going to complicate the hell out of it. She rounded the tire, pounded up her steps, and saw the check mark on her door. Whoever Trish had assigned had been here, at least knocked on the door, knowing I wasn't home. She slammed the door open and palmed on the lights, the first thing she noticed was the rifle rack, empty. Cap had at least made it this far. Cap? No answer. She'd turned, headed back out, when the Quetzal sent a shock through her, bending her double. She gasped. A blinding pain stunned her, a terrible pain, like something jagged being pulled sideways through her guts. She barely realized when the rifle slipped from her fingers to clatter onto her floor. Reeling, she staggered for balance, barely made it to her couch. The pain receded. What the fuck was that? She gasped, struggling to catch her breath. Now. With every last ounce of her strength, she fought her way to her feet, started toward the door only to have the Quetzal strike again. She heard herself shriek from the pain. Both hands went to her stomach as she bent double and threw up. Fuck! She screamed, 
when she could finally spit and clear her mouth. Tell! The hoarse call barely penetrated her staggered senses. Run! The voice rasped. She glanced at the door to her bedroom, tried to make sense of the image. Cap seemed to float in the doorway, feet inches above the floor, legs swaying and flopping. Something big, black, and looming filled the darkness in the room behind him. The Quetzal inside her radiated in hot glee. Talina pawed for her pistol, gritted her teeth, and drew it from the holster. Cap! she gasped, trying to gulp air. Run! She lifted the pistol, tried to align the sights with whatever held his body to block the doorway. Agony stabbed through her like a steel spike. The world spun, and she vaguely felt herself hit the floor, lost the pistol. Every muscle in her body convulsed. Why are you doing this? She whispered through tears. She blinked, fingers slipping along the floor. From the corner of her eye, she saw Cap as he was flung across the room to slam into the counter that separated her kitchen from the main room. He hit the counter like a rag doll, the impact loud in the room. The Quetzal that emerged from her bedroom shifted from black to a blaze of white and crimson. The thing was big, a good six meters in length and just shy of two meters at the hips. It carefully closed with her and lowered its head to stare into her eyes. Paralyzed from within, she stared from eye to eye, the head so close she couldn't focus on all three at once. Faster than she could react, the Quetzal's tongue blurred, striking past her lips and parted her teeth. A squeal tried to form at the bottom of her throat. She jerked her head back as saliva rushed to fill her mouth. The taste was overpowering, bitter peppermint. The tongue flickered this way and that, alien, invasive. Talina stiffened outraged by the violation, and clamped down with all the power in her jaws, like biting into a roll of leather. She tried to chew the Quetzal's tongue in two. The Quetzal shrilled. Talina's head was whipped sideways, the muscles nearly pulled from the bones in her neck and shoulders. She hit the wall with a thud, wondering if her teeth had been yanked from their sockets. For a moment, the impact freed her from the beast's hold inside her, she clambered up, supported by the wall. You kill me. We now kill you. You're related, she realized, the peppermint extract taste of Quetzal cloying in her mouth. Born together. One for one. Revenge, she whispered. That's the word. The great Quetzal was closing, pulsing in bands of crimson, yellow, and black. The collar flared wide around the beast's scaled head, dazzling in its distracting display. Talina stared, mesmerized by the brilliant colors. Some part of her howled in terror as the serrated jaws separated. The creature's three eyes glowed from an inner light that sparked with hatred and rage. The deafening report of a pistol shot broke the spell, and the great Quetzal turned in a flash. Cap had staggered to his feet, somehow managed to lay his hands on Talina's pistol. He wobbled, blinked, took a breath, and shot again. To brace himself, he leaned his hip against her crotch, tried to steady his rubbery arms as the pistol wavered in his grip. The Quetzal struck with its tail, taking Cap's legs out from under him as it smashed him into the wall. The couch went with him, crashing through the side of the dome. In an instant, 
Talina closed her eyes, filled her head with images of water. She was drowning, sinking, thrashing for air. She looked up, imagining a bobbing pattern of sunlight through waves, clawed futilely for the surface as she sank. Then she imagined the sensation of water filling her lungs, the bursting sense of panic. The beast inside her cowered back. She felt its hold on her loosen. Talina staggered to the door where it still hung open. She threw herself out, tumbled painfully down the steps. The quetzal in her gut shrilled its rage as it tried to fight its way back into control. Quetzal at my house, she screamed hoarsely into her calm. What? Where? Your house? On all fours, Talina scrambled past the tire on the loader. She huddled back against the front axle as the hunting Quetzal leaped onto the street. Clawed feet thumped into the dirt just beyond the bucket. Talina bent to the comm mic. Fuck you, yes! Get here! In triumph, the Quetzal issued a whistling shriek and ducked its head down to peer at her under the flat-bottomed bucket. Talina! She ignored the rest of Two Spot's frantic questions as the Quetzal's gaze met hers. Talina slipped under the axle as the creature shot its head under the bucket and snapped its jaws within inches of her body. Then, in a lightning move, the huge beast darted around the tire. Talina barely had time to roll back under the axle as the jaws closed on air where she'd been, but a heartbeat before. She vaguely heard two spots chattering in her earbud. Swallowing hard, heart pumping fear through her veins, she clawed at her belt, found only her knife. The Quetzal screamed, bounced back to the front, and thrust its head under the bucket. Talina rolled back under the axle, every muscle trembling. She sucked breath into her shivering lungs. How long could she keep this up? Again the Quetzal shifted, and again her body convulsed in pain. She barely made it back under the axle. A game of time. And if the beast in her belly could recover? If it fully unleashed that pain again? Slowed her just a bit more than it already did. Talina cradled her knife before her, gripping the handle. You can't kill a Quetzal with a knife. Striking at the scaled head, it would just slip off. Strike at an eye? Sure. The only way she'd be able to reach it was if the fucking thing already had hold of her. She rolled under the axle as the Quetzal ducked around the tire, jaws clapping shut like a shot. Talina glanced up. The gap behind the bucket and load arms was a chance. Could she wiggle up in that space? Could she do it in time? This time the Quetzal tried the other tire. She barely whipped her foot away as she rolled under the axle. Nothing to lose. She leaped up, got an arm around a bundle of hydraulic hoses. Hanging, she barely managed to jerk her feet up in time. Quetzal jaws snapped within an inch of her toes. Talina fought to fill her lungs to keep her hold in the awkward close quarters. Come on, someone has to be on the way. Where's the Marines when you need them? Two spots was still yammering questions she didn't have time for. She felt the machine shake as the Quetzal tried to squeeze itself under the bucket. Talina pulled herself higher, got her arms over the bundled hydraulic lines. How long could she keep her legs drawn up? How long before the muscles in her belly and thighs tired? She could already feel them burning. And then the pain hit her, causing her to scream, Fuck you! Rescue wasn't coming fast enough. She took a deep breath against the pain. With nothing left to her, she wedged the knife in amongst the hydraulic lines. As hope failed and the pain lanced through her again, she entrusted all of her weight to the knife. 
It would either hold her or... Everything let loose in a spray of fluid. In that weightless instant, she felt herself fall. The Quetzal's head was down there, just below. Chapter 71 Trish was in the lead as she and Katsuro rounded the corner onto Tal's dark street. As the Marine flashed his shoulder lights to illuminate the scene, it looked like the Quetzal was digging its way under a huge front-end loader. At that instant, the bucket dropped, edge down, to trap the beast. Fantastic colors burst and flared across its hide. Panicked, the Quetzal was thrashing, rocking the heavy loader back and forth. The long body whipped this way and that. Even as Trish pulled up and took aim, the monster gave one last mighty heave. She heard the snap, then the Quetzal stilled, quivering, patterns of crazy color rolling across its hide like waves. Trish settled the sights forward of the shoulders and triggered the gun. The report split the night. Recoil rocked her back. A second later, Katsuro's rifle boomed. The Quetzal's body jumped under the impacts as the explosive bullets tore it apart inside. The tail was still shivering reflexively when Trish took a breath, aimed, and put a second round at the junction of the shoulders. That should have severed the nerve cord, she told Katsuro. Fuck me the Marine said, through an awed whisper. That's what a Quetzal looks like? There you go, Private. Welcome to Donovan, Trish said warily, as she stepped wide to get a side view of the thing. Tal? she called. You all right? Nothing. Trish sucked a breath into her run-starved lungs. Oh, God! Tell, tell me you're not halfway down that thing's throat. Swallowing hard, she stepped closer, finger hanging in the air above the trigger. Katsuro's light glared on the Quetzal, where its neck was pinioned to the dirt by the sharp bucket edge. Lots of steel pushing down. Katsuro shook his head. Yeah. That last thrashing? The way it went still? Probably broke its neck before I could shoot it in two. Trish took another step. Tal? She'd never seen the like. A Quetzal, trapped like this. It almost looked like the loader was trying to devour the beast. Katsuro? You watch this thing. If it so much as twitches, shoot it again. She set her rifle to the side and eased up to the big tire. Pulling her flashlight, she flicked it on and peered into the gap behind the big bucket. At first, what she saw didn't make any sense. Tal? My God! Did that thing just puke you back up? You're all covered with gut juice and spit. Talina, gasping and trembling, sat next to the triangular head with its broad jaws agape, the tongue partially extended, the three eyes set in their triangular pattern atop the skull, were fixed. Talina looked like a drowned rat. Her entire body was covered in fluid, that gleamed in the light. Tal blinked, eyes wide. Trish? That you? Yeah. It's all right, Tal. You're safe. It's dead. So close. Die now. That's what it said. Who said? The Quetzal? Talina nodded 
her hair a soaked mass of black that plastered to her head. Her skin shone, wet and dripping. It swallowed you? Tal blinked, absently wiped at the liquid. So close. Hang on. We'll need to get Jax. Something to lift this bucket to get you out of there. Talina snorted, as if amused. No, I'm all right. Tal, you sure? It's like you're dazed. Not all here. You get hit in the head? What a fucking day. Through the gap above the tire, Trish watched her friend slap the Quetzal's head, use her feet to shove it out of the way, and then flatten herself, wiggle under the axle, and crawl wearily out from beneath the loader. Trish hesitated, then offered her a hand, feeling the slick fluid as it slathered onto her palm and fingers. What is this stuff? She pulled a wobbly Talina to her feet. Gut juice? It's like not eating your skin off or anything, is it? Relax, Trish. It's hydraulic fluid. And God, is Montoya going to be pissed when he learns I cut the lines? Shig's voice came in through Trish's calm. What's the status out there, people? Trish accessed her calm. Quetzal's dead. Tal's shaken, but slimy. Final score, loader one, Quetzal zero. You need a cart? Anyone hurt? Talina, her hands and legs still quivering from either fear or exhaustion, said, Yeah, Cap's in pretty bad shape. Make sure Raya has the surgery ready. Get that cart here, ASAP, Shig. Minutes could count. Talina signed off, staring absently at the colors fading on the Quetzal's hide. How did it know to pick your house? It's a mate, brother, spouse, whatever, to the one I killed that day in the canyon. It came here for revenge, Trish. You know how crazy that sounds? Talina nodded, eyes focused on something only she could see. It knew when it found my house. Call it scent, taste, whatever. It kept Cap alive to use as a human shield. And then it lay in wait. No shit? Oh, you have no idea. Talina wiped at a trickle of hydraulic fluid as it ran down her cheek. The nightmares have just started. Chapter 72 the gentle hand on Calico's shoulder brought her awake. Her back and butt ached, and her legs had gone to sleep. She blinked her eyes open, realized her head rested on an arm, the arm on a table. She jerked herself upright, staring at the drool spot on her black sleeve. The conference room, the map now rolled up and gone, the table bare, met her disoriented gaze. A cold cup of coffee sat by her elbow, the surface scummy, a ring around the inside of the cup. Supervisor? Yvette Duchesne asked. Come on, I've got a room for you. Maybe not the sort of bed you're used to, but it will beat the hell out of that chair. My Marines? Over at Tal's, looking at the Quetzal. They got it? Tal did, actually. But that's a story for tomorrow. Calico managed to stand and made a face as the circulation returned to her legs. I should get back to the shuttle. Gates locked till morning. Duchesne arched an eyebrow. You're dead on your feet. How long since you've had a good night's sleep? 
damned if I remember. She rubbed her face. Come on. I must be out of my mind, she thought. Calico's first steps were mincing as she followed Duchesne down the hall and out into the night. The cool air, the half-moon midway up in the eastern sky, the distant trill of the invertebrates, all seemed to partially rejuvenate her. The dome Duchesne led her to was indeed close, fortunately, because Calico's thoughts were filled with cobwebs. That Vague feeling that she had to do something kept slipping past her memory. Whose place is this? Mine, Duchesne told her. At Calico's hesitation, the woman added, Or what? You figuring to rent one of Inga's beds over the distillery? At least with me you'll have privacy. You don't even like me. No shit, but we can talk about it in the morning. Not surprisingly, Duchesne's small dome had a homey look with lace curtains, tasteful furniture that had to be of local manufacture, and a library full of antique-bound books. The throw rug had a quaint appeal and was made of what looked like strips of braided cloth. The guest bedroom had been furnished with the barest of necessities. Bed, storage chests, wardrobe, and a curtain over the window. I should go back, Calico protested one last time. It's the middle of the night, Supervisor. There's nothing that can't wait, and you're dead on your feet. Calico settled herself on the bed. Not exactly the high-tech, interactive mattress she was used to. Still, she glanced up, eyes feeling hot and gritty. You know, I was going to execute you. Yeah, fancy that. Duchesne gave her a smile, flicked off the lights, and closed the door. God, they're all lunatics every last one. She swung her feet up, dropped her head on the pillow. Just a couple of hours, she promised herself. Get up at dawn and finally make a decision. She didn't remember drifting off. That night, the nightmares didn't come. Chapter 73 Water spread in a V-shaped wake as the bow of the canoe sliced across the smooth surface. Clouds made patterns in the Minnesota sky overhead. Max's paddle dripped water as he stroked in time with his father. Dad sat behind, in the back of the canoe, and periodically used his paddle to steer as they passed through the narrow channel separating the chain of lakes. So peaceful. The next instant, Max was floating, hanging in a black space as he gently corrected attitude on his suit to keep him oriented toward the distant sun. Nothing in life had prepared him for the sensations of freefall, the tickle in the gut, the weightless joy. He might not have been part of the universe, disconnected from it, a moat of reality in the infinity of creation. Some part of him wanted to float that way forever, convinced that he made his own eternity. Images tumbled through him, basic training, He'd thrived on the physical challenges, enjoyed pushing his body because he was better than the others. And he'd hated advanced training, the classroom sessions, that, despite the implants, had left him feeling challenged and inferior. 
He'd always been a physical guy. The intricacies of combined weapons synchronization, multi-force tactical operations, and the multiple unit drone coordination and movement hadn't clicked for him. All of which pretty much limited him to a field commission, company command. That was as high as he was going to go in the Marines. In the mirror of his dreams, he saw himself reflected. That fuck-you smile on his lips. The one he adopted when he didn't give a shit because he knew the system had pigeonholed him. That he'd become a cog in the great military machine. That it detailed him and his Marines to a specific job. As heedless about employing him to subdue an incipient rebellion as it was to use a core drill to sample the mineral content of an asteroid. That's who I was. Until Donovan. Until Talina Paris. His dreams filled with her high cheekboned face, the otherworldly glint in her dark eyes, her delicious lips bent in a smile for him, the flashing of her white teeth. Her hips swayed in that captivating way she walked. Capella's sunlight highlighted blue tints in her raven-black hair. He could feel her in his arms, substantial, warm, and solid. All woman, that one. Daring and hard. She'd faced him toe-to-toe, -to -toe, taken him into her own embrace, his soul warmed at the memory of her body against his as they made love, how she gasped and trembled at that magic moment. I love her, with all of my body and soul. A distant pain intruded, a sense of wrongness that clawed at the misty margins of his dream. Three eyes in a triangular pattern burned in the darkness, Pain, fear, helplessness, his trinity of terror. Cap gasped as the dream faded and that sense of wrongness slipped up around his consciousness. Got to warn Tal, he heard himself whisper. The pain intensified as if someone were twisting a dial. He's coming out of it, a voice said from somewhere just above him. Cap? Tal's voice, like an angelic relief, asked softly. Cat's all, he croaked. Got to warn you. I got it, Cap. It's dead. Dead? He shivered, the pain eating through him like acid. The thing was still holding him, its claws fastened in his flesh. The image replayed. Tal stepping in the door of her house, the claws tightening, ripping deeper into his shoulders and back to stifle his urge to call out. Dear God, he whispered, the wetness of tears on his tightly clamped eyelids. It's all right, Cap, Talina told him, her soothing voice next to his ear. He blinked, vision watery and out of focus. Caught me by surprise. I know. Talina's face swam into view, and she used a cloth to sponge his eyes. You did good, Cap. You got my pistol. Those shots you took, that saved us both. Distracted it, gave me the chance I needed. Shots? He struggled with vague memories of crawling to where Tal's pistol had been kicked his way in the scuffle. Had he really grasped it? Was that real, or his desperate imagination? I shot it. Just before it whacked you with its tail. Raya says it's a wonder you could even stand, given the amount of blood you'd lost and as torn up as your back was. He either imagined or remembered the pistol bucking in his hands, 
and the losing struggle to hold it steady, to find a sight picture. And then it hit me, didn't it? He swallowed hard. After that. Hit you with its tail, Cap. Smacked you into the wall. Broke you up pretty badly. He blinked again, struggling to focus on the hazy ceiling overhead. What's that thing? Up there. Big and round. Talina glanced up. That's a light, Cap. Raya uses it for surgery. She hesitated, glanced questioningly at someone out of sight, then said, You've been hurt. You're in the hospital. You've got broken bones, internal injuries. Raya's got the bleeding stopped. I came to tell you to get well. He heard her voice break as she added, And that I love you and need you to get better. I love you, too, he whispered. Light made a halo around her head, shining in her hair and shadowing her face. Cap, Talina told him bravely, Raya's going to send you back to the dream now. Remember what I told you. You love me. I have to get better. He felt her lips on his, warm and tender, tried to respond to them, but things were growing hazy. He was floating again, down through the gray mist toward his vacuum suit and the free fall, dropping back to being a moat in the wonder of creation. Talina loves me. All of existence faded in comparison to that. Chapter 74 It's serious. Raya Turnyenko sat with her butt hitched up on her desk corner, a cup of coffee in her right hand, the elbow cradled with her left. As she talked, she swung her left foot where it hung free of the floor, Talina sat in Raya's office chair, where it had been pulled out from behind the woman's desk. Outside, a gentle rain spattered on the roof and ran in trickles down the window. Talina fought an expression of distaste as the quetzal curled inside. Piece of shit. Raya continued. The broken legs and pelvis, the liver, spleen, and kidney, those will heal. Same thing with the lacerations. I've managed to suture the worst of the damage. Thank God we've got the antibiotics to kill the infection that was bound to follow. I'll take the drains out in a week or so, if there are no complications. A beat, as her dark eyes hardened. But, Tal, you do understand. There's nothing I can do about the spine. Not here. Not with these facilities. The med lab on Turalon? Which meant she'd have to steal the shuttle. Best they could do is stabilize him until they made it back to Solar System. Raya took a deep breath. Talina, when Cap hit that wall, his lower thoracic vertebrae were severely... Well, think of the bones as crushed jelly. And the three fractured cervical vertebrae aren't much better... Tal leaned forward, dropping her head into her hands. So, what you're telling me? When I dial back the drugs, he's got feeling in his hands, Tal. That's a good sign. I've got him in chemical paralysis. I was able to position and pin the fragments of cervical vertebrae, and I've got the inflammation under control to relieve pressure on the spinal cord in his neck. Whether he'll have use of his upper body... That I won't know until after the cervical fractures begin to form callus and start to knit. Until then, I can't risk him moving and screwing it all up. Talina took a deep breath, 
trying to soothe the sick feeling in her gut. This is going to kill him. The miracle is that he made it this far. Not only did that thing beat the hell out of him and rip the ever-loving shit out of his back, it bounced him off your counter and nearly threw him through your wall. So what's next? One day at a time, Talina. Raya studied her thoughtfully. You up for this? It's going to be a long road ahead. If he makes it, it will be because he finds the will to live. That means he's got to have something, someone, to live for. I'm in. Raya, the guy saved my life. And had he not bought me the time to kill the thing, who knows how many more it would have taken before we stopped it. This whole fucking town owes him. Raya nodded, seeming to come to a conclusion. I just wanted you to know the extent of the damage. Yeah. Thanks. Talina stood, winced, and rubbed her neck muscles. Caps wasn't the only neck that took a beating. Quetzal tongues are tough as leather, let me tell you. In the end, you and Cap were tougher. Yeah? You keep believing that, Raya. Fairy tales are good for people. Or so my mama used to say. She stepped out into the hall, wincing at her own injuries. She might have been a Quetzal herself, given how colorful, large, and plentiful her own bruises were turning out to be. The beast lay like a stone in her belly. Jesus, what came next? The thing had tried to kill her. When would it try again? Yeah, well, fuck you. She told it as she headed for the door. She had other troubles just now. Cap? A paraplegic? She thought back to his smile, the way his blue eyes shone, how he'd taken to the bush, learning, finding himself. She could almost feel his warm and strong hand on her breast, how it had reassured her, the way he'd looked the time she'd come home to find him on her doorstep. He'd given up everything for her. She stopped, eyes blurring with tears. Leaning against the hallway wall, she fought back the sobs. Chapter 75 In the hollow, Captain Abibi's tan-brown eyes were level, professional, and unblinking. Having not heard from you in the allotted twelve hours, I am left with no other conclusion that the decision to space is mine, and mine alone. As a result of that, I have given the order. Turlon is currently accelerating for our inversion point, which we should reach within the week. Know that I didn't take this step lightly, however. The disposition of my crew, their failing morale, and the contractual requirements and conditions of the returnees necessitated my decision. My full report will be placed on file with the Corporation upon our return to Solar System. Should you have an addendum you wish submitted, I will be delighted to attach it herewith. I have left you with a heavy lift, a seven-series shuttle, serial number 87550892277. Said craft should provide you with access to the entirety of Donovan, as well as to the corporate vessel Freelander that we've left in stable orbit around the planet. If any of these circumstances or decisions is in contradiction to your express demands, interests, or orders, you must immediately communicate the nature and remedy of that contradiction, and I will do everything in my power to accede to your orders. If I do not hear from you in the next twelve hours, I will assume that I have your complete concurrence, and will take all appropriate measures to ensure the success of my mission. The image flickered out. 
Calico leaned back in her desk chair, wrapped her fingers on the scarred duraplast surface, and stared glumly around her office in the admin dome. A sense of despair sucked at her, seeking to pull her down into the depths of depression. Just a couple of hours until sunrise. That was all she'd promised herself that she'd sleep after the Quetzal affair. Instead, and to her horror, she'd awakened and stumbled out to find Duchesne's house empty. Worse, when she'd emerged, it was into a rainy night. Checking with the Marine standing guard, she found that she'd almost slept around the clock. What the hell was wrong with me? she demanded of herself. She turned, staring at the dark window behind her. The rain continued. Running nervous fingers through her hair, she stood and paced before the desk, aware of the two Marines on guard outside her door. Got a minute? Shig Mosadek asked, appearing in the hallway. His short stature seemed incongruous, though it somehow matched his round face and the pug nose beneath that mop of tangled black hair. A curious gleam lay behind his dark eyes. A minute? A week? A couple of years? Hell, I might even have a lifetime, Mr. Mosadek. Ah, well, then might I invite you to share a drink with me? Inga has decasked, uncasked, decorked, oh, you know, whatever they call it. She's serving a new wine over at the tavern tonight. I wondered if I might buy you a glass while we discuss some of the consequences of your continued presence in Port Authority. She laughed bitterly. Yes, I suppose you'd be more than a little concerned about that. From behind his back, Shig produced a raincoat. I thought you might benefit from this. I don't know how you might be outfitted for the weather. She walked over, spreading her arms. I'm assured that my possessions are aboard that A-7 out on the shuttle pad. But she's locked up. The crew's somewhere here in town. And more to the point, it's after dark and the gate's locked. As it well should be. Shig handed her the raincoat and turned to lead the way. Have you a place to stay? I... No. She made a face as she pulled on the raincoat. All of this has... Um... Taken me a bit by surprise. The Marines fell in step behind. I understand. He led the way out into the night. Misty rain glowed in the cones of the overhead lights. Tourlon's spacing back took us all by surprise. The first we learned about it was when two spots reported that Captain Abibi had radioed saying that she was having difficulty receiving any of our transmissions. Two spots immediately checked the system and radioed her that, to the contrary, our system was working fine. And the good captain radioed back that your transmission was breaking up? I would think you were clairvoyant, Supervisor. She glanced over her shoulder at the two Marines. What did they think? Happy to be stranded here? Or really pissed off? Half of them had mutinied, wanting to stay. The others, backing Spiro, had voted to return. Or had they? Had it just been a sense of duty? Three of them were still missing. Desertion? A new, unsettling reality now lurked just under her consciousness. The Marines had always been her ultimate authority. Had that, too, gone hollow? At Inga's, Shig led the way inside and down the stairs. The place assaulted her ears with a low-level roar that dropped a decibel or ten 
as people recognized her. Shig, however, was smiling and waving to individuals, returning greetings as if they were old friends. At the bar, Shig led the way to the empty stool at the end that belonged to Paris. With a wave, he dispersed the closest customers and took the chair next to Paris's. Talina won't mind. She's at the hospital looking after Cap. Calico climbed onto Paris's sacred stool and felt a vindictive satisfaction in doing so. How's he doing? Badly, I'm afraid. The Quetzal showed him little mercy. Might have been better if it had killed him. He lifted an eyebrow. You don't seem sympathetic. We didn't part on the best of company. Shig lifted two fingers as Inga strode down her bar. With a curt nod, she turned back. A big wooden keg rested on blocks in the rear, and from the bung spigot, Inga filled one glass full, the other half. She deposited the full one before Calico. The half she placed on the scarred chabacho at Shig's elbow. As she did, the man laid out a coin. What's that? Calico asked, picking it up. The image of a Quetzal head decorated one side. The other sported a crossed pick and shovel. The number two stood out prominently on each side. A silver two SDR piece. We've just started to have them struck. I've had Tyrell Lawson working on a master die. Figured we needed our own currency. Me, I've never liked SDRs, or Yuan. They're made of plastic, you know. Just isn't the same as specie. Oh, we'll keep the plastic and paper currency, of course. The difference being that we'll back them with precious metals and gemstones. Starting your own bank? Unfortunately, Mr. Worth forced our hand when he began handing out loans. He might have Port Authority's vices by the balls, but we'd rather not let him get his grip on the rest. She raised her glass as Shig raised his. To Donovan. Shig toasted and clinked the rims. She tasted the red liquid, found it only slightly acid. Not bad. We do have certain amenities, Shig told her, replacing his glass. I like that one. A half glass? She lifted a skeptical eyebrow as she took a bigger swig of her own. The better to save her. Shig glanced over his shoulder as a table erupted in laughter behind them. We need to find you a residence. Several of the domes in the residential section are open. I'd rather stay in the shuttle, though I'll have to figure out a way to get to it. Yvette told me that you are welcome to her spare room until you find something more appropriate to your tastes. That's kind of her, but I'd rather not. She said the bed suited you, but I do understand. If you're not picky, Inga has rooms on the second story of her place. She rents them out to people who come in from the bush. I'm picky. Then they might not do. You could sleep in Clemenceau's old quarters next to your office, I suppose. She laughed. Are we really having this conversation? I'm the pus-sucking supervisor. A corporate personage in a town without a single corporate property except an office in the admin dome. A fascinating culmination of events, don't you think? She gave him a scathing look. What do you suggest? I could loan you my study. Your study? A small dome behind my garden? 
I go there to get away, to meditate, to read, and to write my treatises on religion and philosophy. It's clean, has a small kitchen, a stunning and contemplative view of the perimeter fence, and the bed is most comfortable. I had the sheets, nice chamois ones, by the way, changed just on the odd chance you might want to camp there. It's quiet, and you'd have privacy. She chuckled. I'm broke. Coinage has been out of style in the corporation for some time now. I'll trade. What? Oh, something will come along one of these days. I have faith in you. It won't hold your marines. I'd dicker with Inga over those apartments. He smiled. She'll extend credit to cover the rentals if I vouch for you. You? She tried to keep the acid out of her voice. Will vouch for me? Shig studied his wine thoughtfully. You made the right choice, by the way. Letting a BB and Turalon space. I was a coward, and a BB knew it, she thought. But then, like the time she'd lied to Nandi, Abibi's strength was in letting people believe or do that which worked in the best interest of her ship and crew. To Shig, she said, Maybe Milton was right. It's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Which brings me to my question. How do you see this working? She considered him through narrowed eyes. I signed Port Authority over to you. Let you buy the mines, properties, and equipment. That's a done deal. Freelander, however, and everything she carried, is still corporate property. Despite the fact that your people have carted off half of it, more like a third. Wouldn't matter if it was a quarter. It belongs to the corporation. We have title. Or is that concept just a sham? Would you prefer if we just left it to sit, rust, and decay on the shuttle field? It would sit, rust, and decay as corporate property. As supervisor, it's mine to administer as I see fit. That's corporate law. Your law, too, if this title and property rights jag of yours is for real. How would you enforce it? My marines are corporate. She glanced around. And, for the moment, I don't think you've got anyone who could dispute that fact. Shig gave her that benign smile that curdled her gut. Then it appears we have a curious impasse. You have the Freelander equipment, but no one to run it, and nowhere to employ it. We've got the mines, the know-how, and the people who can fabricate parts and maintain your equipment. There's a whole planet out there, she countered and I've got more than three hundred people on contract. Something tells me they'll be able to use that equipment just fine. And you think you can enforce that contract if they're no longer willing? I have marines. You'd have revolution. As we learned the other night, those waters have already been tempestuously churned, they need time to settle out and again grow tranquil. She arched a challenging eyebrow, her mind clicking through possibilities. So? Tell me. What do you suggest? 
You have more than Marines. You have a heavy lift shuttle. And, as you said, it's a big planet, one with better ore deposits and richer diggings than we've been working here. Our people are settled, making a nice living when something isn't eating them. Thank you. Your transportees need direction, a chance to make their own wealth. Your shuttle and equipment, more than your marines, allows them the opportunity to do so. What's the triumvirate's angle in all this? What do you get out of it? Survival. He tilted his wine in her direction. And on Donovan, that's all that matters. Status and power? He shook his head. Clemenceau had those alleged advantages. He might not have had Marines, but he had Talina Perez and her security force, at least in the beginning. She said nothing, letting her expression communicate her distaste at the ultimate outcome for Clemenceau. Shig raised his eyebrows in response. Supervisor, let me ask, how smart are you? Just as she formed an unpleasant retort, he raised a hand. I care not for what you knew back in Solar System, but how clever— capable and agile are you when it comes to learning new rules, adapting, and finding innovative ways to solve problems in a totally novel environment. That's what it takes, huh? That's what it takes. Off the record, given all that's behind us, after all, I wanted you arrested and shot, Surely there's part of you that wants to see me fail, that would revel in my defeat and destruction. Actually, and much to my surprise, you've succeeded remarkably well to this point. Your first test was the trial. You were smart enough to back off, though it was a closely run thing. You could have failed again when we asked you to honor the titles. And finally, you've shown promise by staying behind. I was left. Oh, come. The sham about radio communications makes a satisfying cover story. Abibi's a professional. She gave you an out. Don't buy the story that I was afraid. Damn you, Cap. You'd be a fool if you weren't. I overslept. Uh-huh. Are you purposefully trying to enrage me? By no means. Shig smiled peacefully and took a delicate sip of his wine again. I'm establishing that I think you have a chance here. Oh, to be sure. You're struggling to surmount a lot of cultural debris clogging your mental pathways. But if you can manage to set that aside, look past who you were back on Transluna, ignore who you wanted to be back then, I think you're capable of great things on Donovan. You're saying I have potential? She snapped off the words, more so than the vast majority of transportees who come here. Transportee? Thanks for your glowing endorsement. She let the acid drip. Shig, as if oblivious, said, You're welcome. Maybe I should still have you shot. The evening is young. And, as you say, you do have marines. Calico shook her head. You're all lunatics. Lunacy is catching, Supervisor. It's Donovan. My suspicion is that you'll have caught a dose of it yourself 
before this is all over. And with that, he clinked her glass in a toast. Chapter 76 Hey, handsome man, how are you doing? The words had echoed around the inside of Cap's head for hours as he stared at the eternity of his hospital room ceiling. Talina had said it that morning as she breezed in. He'd answered in his croaking voice. Ternyenko had dialed back the drugs just enough to let him speak. For most of the visit, she'd pulled up a chair and sat just out of his field of vision. Her talk had been bright, optimistic. She'd told of how Turalon had spaced and was headed for the inversion point, of how Supervisor Aguila now lived in Shig Mozadek's little work studio as she took an inventory on the Freelander cargo, of how Cap just needed to concentrate on healing and obey Ternyenko's orders, and how he'd be out of hospital before he knew it. He had replied with short pleasantries, Oh? Good. Really? That's it for now, she told him, appearing again in his cone of vision. Holding her hair back, she'd given him a kiss and claimed, I'll be back in a couple of hours. And, but for a couple of checks by Ternyenko to monitor his IV pack and his urine for blood and volume, he'd had nothing but the eternity of the ceiling. The doctor had laid it all out, the fractures in his spine and neck, the broken ribs and legs, how he was lucky to be alive. Cap had taken it, told her he understood, and waited until she'd left the room before he surrendered to the hollow agony that still possessed him. In the days since, he'd pleaded with Ternyenko to let him die made her swear not to tell Talina, and the Siberian doctor had given him a knowing smile, her dark eyes like cold stones behind the flat features of her face. He heard the steps as someone entered the room and called out, Tal? That you? He could no longer judge time. It could have been a couple of hours since she left, maybe days for all he knew. Sorry. The face appeared as he shifted his eyes as far to the left as they'd go. You? Me. What are you doing here? You have quite a string of enemies. Now, here you are. Sure, they could fix you up back at Transluna, tailor a genetic regeneration program, and trick your bones into growing back together. Initiate spinal cord growth, nerve renewal, and orchestrate the remodeling of scar tissue. A pause. But not here. Ternyenko doesn't have the technology or the specialized skill. Okay. You've really cheered me up. Now get the hell out. Have you heard the saying on Donovan? That people come here to find themselves to leave, or to die? Which of those applies to you? Cap took a breath, one of the few controls he still had over his body. You'd think it was to die, wouldn't you? He wet his lips. But it was to find myself. So? Did you? Cap smiled. You wouldn't understand. A pause, as if for thought. Finally, the question. You know why I'm here? I think so. If I'm wrong, I'll be disappointed in my judgment of human nature. How do you want me to do it? They've got me drugged. 
I won't feel a bullet or a blade. So pain's out, if that's what you were looking forward to. Still, choose. I'm curious as to what it will be. Cat flicked his eyes to the right and down. There, on the IV pack on my arm. See the little wheel? With your thumb, spin it open. And what happens? It paralyzes the rest of me. Lungs, heart. I just fade away. Why don't I just slit your throat? Couldn't feel it if you did. The dramatic effect will be wasted. Why horrify whoever walks through that door next? And someone, probably Ternyenko's assistant, Felicity, will have to clean up the mess. You'd still see your blood blowing through your severed windpipe. What did Felicity ever do to you? Cap swallowed hard, smiled as his visitor walked around the bed and reached for his right arm. Thanks, he whispered. Call it an ultimate act of love. Cap nodded, closed his eyes, let himself drift. In moments... He'd be back, floating in his vacuum suit, forever in the miracle of freefall. Chapter 77 Talina Paris sat on an angular chunk of sandstone, her gaze fixed on the fresh red mound of earth, and its head, a duraplast marker, read, Captain Maxwell Taggart, corporate marine, killed by Quetzal. Filling her lungs with the morning, she let the gentle breeze coming in from the gulf play with a few strands of hair that had escaped her braid. Her rifle lay across her knees, a stone's throw away, Capella's slanting sunlight illuminated the eastern side of Donovan's stone monument, where it dominated the cemetery. On the other side of Cap's grave, fern grass had grown thickly over Mitch's final resting place. Earlier, she'd straightened his duraplast marker and given it a pat. She glanced over her shoulder as Shig came striding up, his hands behind his back, the wind tousling his unruly mop of hair. The morning sun reflected his beatific smile. Might have powered it, as a matter of fact. He wore faded brown overalls and Quetzal hide boots that shimmered in rainbow patterns. You shouldn't be out here. Shig found his way to another of the square sandstone rocks. When the backhoe pulled them up, the operators had made a habit of leaving them out rather than have the bereaved watch a big, heavy chunk of stone be dumped atop their beloved dead. As if death weren't enough of an indignity. Shig seated himself and said, I think I'm safe. What Quetzal in its right mind would brave Talina Paris when she has her rifle across her lap? As if it heard, the beast inside shifted. Don't be so cavalier. We have to completely rethink Quetzal's, and probably most of Donovanian life. Molecular communication? Sibling relationships? a willingness to sacrifice themselves for a vendetta. The fact that I was specifically targeted and hunted down with all of Port Authority to choose from, that it figured out how to hide in the cargo so that we carried it in. We're talking abstraction and intelligence here. Because it's alien just means it's going to be harder for us to understand. 
let alone the fact that you have one inside you. And I want it out. Cheng's working on that. Haven't seen him this happy in years. Talina closed her eyes and rubbed her face. It wants me dead, Shig. Yet it saved you in the bush. Because it knew its mate was coming for me. Probably why the one out at Briggs didn't kill me. It read in my spit that I was targeted by another. Despite all of that, how are you doing? I'm sitting beside the grave of another man I loved, Shig. Enraged. Outside of feeling like something's been ripped out of my heart and soul with rusty pliers, I'm a fucking model of beaming joy and happiness. She ground her teeth as the grief knot pulled tight in her throat and the tears came. I don't know what to do. She clenched her hands on her rifle. Raya found the drug dial open. All the way. Max couldn't have done that. Someone else did. Max was murdered. She wiped the snot from her nose, heart hammering. Half of me wants to find whoever did it and blow their fucking head off. And half of me wants to kiss whoever did it for... For... She shook her head, finally admitting, Shig, part of me is so relieved, I can't tell you. And that disgusts me. Had it been revenge or mercy? If the latter, had it been done for his sake or hers? And if hers, it just added to her sense of futility? Cap made a lot of enemies, Tao. When an individual embarks on the process of authentic self-discovery, the people around him or her are left feeling betrayed. The person they thought they knew, and could predict and depend upon for their own needs, necessarily becomes someone different. It causes distress all the way around. Then why bother in the first place? Growth and the pursuit of enlightenment are the way of the universe. Cap Taggart took a mighty step from Tamas towards Sattva. What if I don't buy your Buddhist crap? That's Hindu. Whatever. It doesn't matter what we deny or accept. The universe is as it is matter and energy transitioning back and forth, changing relationships between particles, whether souls are modalities or not. Observation creates reality, all of which imperceptivity changes the fabric of the universe itself. So I think I'm on pretty firm ground. Charming. A pause. I'm tired of death, Shig. I'm tired of falling in love and losing them. I'm tired of hurting. All is dukkha. The scars will remain, and they will toughen and turn white with age. But you will heal. You'll go on. Talina rubbed the tears from her face, the breeze cooling her damp cheeks Turalon inverted symmetry in the middle of the night. I wonder if she'll make it. Like Schrodinger's cat? He shrugged. Perhaps. On the other hand, in the perversity of physics, if a ship appears in orbit five or six years from now, we may discover the cat lived. If it happens, it'll still be years from now. That's an eternity on Donovan. We damn well better be planning on making it on our own. The Freelander cargo 
significantly increases our odds. Though the supervisor claims it is her property, how she maintains her authority and defends her title will be interesting in light of Donovan's realities. You might be letting her live in your studio, but you know Aguila's going to be a problem. She's not going to fit in. Unless she surprises me with some hidden strength of character, that might indeed be the case. Shig spread his hands, face tilted to the sun, eyes closed as if in worship. Want me to just put a bullet in her brain? Not for the time being, though I may live to regret that decision. He filled his lungs and sighed. This morning I just needed a walk. Oh, and to remind you that we had a council meeting this afternoon. Council? That's what Dan Worth calls it. He seems to think we're a sort of government, given that we're striking coins and all. A government? It's no longer just us old hands who've simply let things work as they may. And to my absolute distaste. If we don't establish and codify the way we want things to function, either Worth or Aguila will. Each has his or her own power base, and worse, are willing to use them. Ah, shit. Talina's gut fell. Do I have to be there? No. But I can't imagine you'd have been happy to learn that we met with him without your knowledge, or that you wouldn't want to be there on the chance you might discover his hidden motives. Damn you. Are you always right? Only perceptive. Chapter 78 Dan brought his own cup of coffee, laced with a shot of whiskey. He nodded at Step Belenovich, who was headed the other way. A use-scarred rifle hanging from his knobby right hand. Making his way down the hallway, he had to admit, the world was looking up. Entering into the conference room, it was to find Shig Mozadek and Yvette Duchesne already seated across from each other at the far end of the table. Their own coffee cups, apparently the only symbols of office, rested on the scarred wood. In the center, on the hot pad, was a steaming two-liter pot of black coffee. Well, good to see the both of you, Dan greeted. Quite the day, huh? Turlon spaced for home. Her hold's packed with plunder. Wonder what the board members are going to say to that when she docks at Transluna. They'll erupt with a thousand exclamations of glee, no doubt, Yvette told him coldly. So just what, if I might ask, goaded you to call this meeting? Dan seated himself, flipping out a coin as he did so. A one hundred SDR gold piece? Seriously? Yvette stared coldly at him, as though it bore no need of response. Shig picked up the coin and studied it in the light cast by the window. Excellent detail, don't you think? But then you wouldn't know, having never seen a mundo tree. Where's the gold for all these coins coming from? Dan asked, as if an afterthought. We surely didn't hand everything over to Aguila. Yvette continued her cold stare. For a time, Brian Malverson was the richest man on Donovan. Took him twenty trips, and that was when the heavy lift trucks were flying, to haul all of his gold into Port Authority. It stashed somewhere safe. To be credible, a bank must have a reserve. Shig spun the coin around his fingers, and with a flip of the wrist, made it disappear. 
You've forced us into a market economy. The old hit-or-miss barter system was strained as it was. The yuan and SDR notes were wearing out. With titles and deeds guaranteed, not to mention used by people such as yourself for collateral, we couldn't very well expect people to trade a stack of chamois hides for a house, could we? Dan cocked his head. Even as he formed a reply, Talina Paris entered, walked past him without so much as a look, and propped her rifle against the wall as she took a seat next to Yvette. From her belt pouch, she produced a collapsible cup and dipped up coffee. She wore her old black patched-up uniform. The knife and pistol at her hip added to the menacing and deadly air she projected. But look at her face. It was to see a woman tortured with grief. Good. He'd wondered if Cap Taggart was just a fling for her, a short-term sack partner, one of the few men she didn't completely intimidate. As threatening as she was, it had to be hard to find a man who could keep it up long enough and vigorously enough to wring her pelvic charms. Given the red-eyed and haggard look, the tension around her mouth, She'd really cared for the guy. That brought a smile to his lips. Suffer, bitch. Suffer. He pasted a happy smile on his face, saying brightly, Good. We're all here. I guess we can get started. Started with what? Shig asked, and with a snap of his fingers, the coin appeared as if by magic. Good trick that. We had a potential problem with the transportees. Disgruntled, delusioned, incipient revolt, blood in the streets, remember? Which I believe you said you were going to handle. Yvette stared at him over her coffee cup. Misters Oman and Palladoro demonstrated a change of heart. Dan caught the coin when Shig flipped it his way. Haven't seen them around, Shig noted. My sources tell me that their successors have had a parting of the ways, that many are unsure what to do. He smiled. And then there's the supervisor. She's a new piece to the puzzle. She's insisting that as the corporation's supervisor... She still has their contracts. Yes, a complication, wouldn't you say? The problem isn't the woman, Yvette said in velvet tones overlaying steel. It's her marines. I can only speak for the three of us, but we're not going to stand in their way if they start combing the streets for transportees. That's their business, and hers. Which, Shig reminded, I believe might include you. Or don't I recall a clause allowing the corporation to reassign a transportee to a related field? Dan grinned. If she had anything related to a dead cow, I might consider it. Alas, even if she did, I'd have to decline... So many things on my plate these days. All those minor irritations like Paladuro and Oman. Word is that they've opted to explore distant fields. Doubt they'll be causing any further trouble. Shig replied amiably, My sources tell me they disappeared the night the Quetzal got in. Maybe it ate them. Dan let his smile beam. At that, Paris swiveled her head and shot him a deadly look. Not even slightly funny, mister. Sorry, security officer. He let his eyes narrow in reply to hers. 
Perhaps the boys just wandered off. I hear we're still missing three marines, too. And, now that Turalon is gone, we've got bits and pieces of her crew showing up by ones and twos. Dan gestured. You people putting in a claim for them? Leaving them for Aguila? Or calling them free agents? Free agents. Yvette snapped. Okay, fine by me. Let them make their own ways. He cleared his throat. Some, however, have already entered into agreements. I've got paper on them. Signed of their own free will and accord. What kind of paper? Talina asked darkly. A contract, security officer. A legal contract. For labor. Nothing else. A chill eased up his spine on mouse feet as she glared at him. That alien blackness filled her eyes. It was all he could do to keep from raising his hands and backing away. A contract is a contract, Shig agreed, as long as there was no coercion. I may be many things, but I'm not stupid. No coercion. And I have witnesses to that fact. Good. The way Yvette sighted at him over her coffee cup was eerily similar to how she'd be squinting over pistol sights. The cold death in Paris's eyes tickled the fear instinct in his gut. Excuse me, she said. I think I need a breath of clean air. Everyone in the room watched her rise, grab her rifle, and walk from the room. Nevertheless, she pinned him with her eyes the whole way. Relieved, Dan took a breath and said, In summary, I think we're in pretty good shape. With Turalon gone, a lot of the uncertainty went with it. I don't see any problem keeping a lid on the remaining transportees, unless... The supervisor wants them. Yvette said, Get between her and them at your own peril. As for us, we're going to declare ourselves neutral. Shig told him, There will be enough other problems as the new reality sinks in. Hopefully we can continue to find areas of mutual cooperation. Worth got to his feet, gave them a salute with his coffee cup, Always a delight to do business with you. He thought of Paris, of the look she'd given him. You got what you had coming to you, you alien-infested witch. As he exited into the hallway, he was already planning. Not a word had been said about the method of Paladuro and Oman's disappearance. He liked how the triumvirate worked approved of a no-questions-asked policy. They were all complicit now. So, they have a cache of gold. They're starting a central bank and minting coins. Aguila is going to enforce contract on the transportees. How do I profit from this? God, he... Loved opportunity. Chapter 79 The whole thing was by chance. Trish had seen Talina as she emerged from the admin dome. She knew that walk. Tal was a woman on a mission. That she cycled the bolt on her rifle as she left, checking to ensure a round was chambered, bespoke the ominous. Trish chewed her lower lip for a moment, frowned, putting Cap in the ground had hit Talina hard. But damn it, Donovan wasn't a forgiving place. It wasn't like Talina Paris hadn't buried a man before, and this one would have ultimately suffocated her. Shit. She'd really loved him. Wonder what that's like. 
Nevertheless, Trish cut across behind the equipment shed, hurried past the parts depot, and rounded the corner just in time to see Talina climbing the roof access ladder to the assay office. Even as the athletic woman stepped onto the roof, she was unslinging her rifle. Trish took a deep breath, shook her head, and sprinted to the base of the ladder. Step by step, she crept her way up and peered over the stone wall to the sloped roof. Talina was settling herself behind the meter-high stone false front overlooking the main street. She'd taken a kneeling position, left knee up, right out at an angle, ankle under her butt. She pulled the rifle up to her shoulder, left arm supporting, elbow on her knee as she sighted down the barrel. On cat feet, Trish topped the roof. The breeze played with her hair, tossing it about. A loose bit of roofing rattled slightly with each gust, covering any sound she might have made. Taking a position just behind and to the left, she could just see the street and those passing beneath. Oh, shut up, Talina said under her breath. The only thing you and I have left is death, and if I go, you're gone with me, son of a bitch. Trish made a face. That tone of voice. She was talking to the damn Quetzal inside her. Or was she just insane? A new Donovanian form of mental illness that needed its own definition in the psychiatric diagnostic manuals. There he is, Talina told the Quetzal. Thinks I didn't know. She settled her cheek to the stock, eye behind the optics. Trish took another step forward, the roof squeaking just as she saw Dan Worth walking happily down the center of the street. Talina whirled, the rifle, like a thing alive, centering on Trish's chest. The cold quivering of guts and ticking of the nerves at her center was instantaneous, almost debilitating. Tal? Her voice wavered. Don't shoot. It's me, for God's sake. Talina exhaled in relief, lowered the rifle. Trish, what the hell are you doing? Came to see who you were going to shoot. That fucker, Dan Worth. Heard from Toby Montoya. Worth and Cap had words. Almost came to a killing. Not even an hour before the siren went off. What if he didn't kill Cap? Talina's eyes narrowed. What do you mean? I've been asking around, talking to Katsuro. Been seeing a lot of him, haven't you? What of it? She held her hands out, hoping to placate the violence in Tal's eyes. Lots of people wanted Cap dead, starting with Supervisor Aguila. Then there's Lieutenant Spiro and about half of the Marines. They're still trying to figure out if the three missing Marines were sent to kill Cap, and he got them first. That's nuts. And Tal, there are other people. What other people? About half of Port Authority. Trish felt her gut harden into something that felt like dried leather. People who knew Cap, knew you. People who understood that you'd sacrifice yourself to care for an invalid. People who heard Cap beg for death. It wasn't any secret, except from you. Ask Raya. Name me some names. Trish laughed. Inga, me, Step, Yvette, E.G., Cheng, Melly. Two spots, Felicity, hell, probably even Shig. You going to kill us all? So you're saying this was done for me? I... I don't know, Tal. Trish spread her arms, dropped to the extending wall, and felt suddenly exhausted. Hell, go ahead. Shoot the son of a bitch. One of us is going to have to in the end. Might as well be today. 
but from what I've heard, he may not be the person you're after. Her nervous laughter reeked of bitterness. For all I know, it might even have been Raya herself. Pragmatism has never been Raya's weak point. Talina wearily shook her head, resettling herself back against the wall. I'm just hurting, angry, and this fucking thing inside me doesn't give me any rest. It hates me, wants me dead, and I'm starting to agree with it. Don't tell. Please. You're not alone in this. I loved him. Her head drooped, and she picked absently at her rifle. So? Living's a dangerous business. You're special, Tal. People need you. To be needed like that? Respected and looked up to? That's remarkable. More so than you've ever understood. Lucky fucking me. I mean it. Trish stood. Well, shit. We talked so long he's out of sight. She smiled crookedly. Buy you a beer? Your stool's open. Talina gave her a half-lidded stare. Are you insane? Hey, I'm not the one with a Quetzal inside me. You coming? Or am I drinking alone? Talina's laughter reeked of bitterness and defeat. She shook her head, lines of fatigue darkening beneath her eyes. Yeah, if you're not bullshitting about buying. Got one of these new coins Shig is striking. A gold 5 SDR piece. Should set us up for the whole night. Well, get your ass down that ladder, then. Neither one of us is getting any younger. Talina flipped the safety on and shouldered the rifle. With a relieved smile, Trish led the way. Chapter 80 Three months had passed since Turalon had spaced. A soft rain was falling when Pete Morgan stomped the mud off his boots and stepped into the jewel. He tugged the Quetzal hide hat off of his head and gave it a shake to clear the water off. As he tramped across the floor, he was feeling pretty good about himself. Thank God he knew how to operate a core drill. He'd signed on with Ollie Throlson when it became apparent that Supervisor Aguila was serious about enforcing contracts. The last place he wanted to be was in town where Marines were conscripting people. The Throlson claim lay out west, on the other side of the Wind Mountains. Atop a large dome formation, it had originally been recorded as a potential location for hydrocarbons. Ollie had managed to snare one of the core drills before Supervisor Aguila could get it recorded on her inventory. Lawson had figured out how to power it with a steam-powered electrical generator. Drilling mud hadn't been a problem, given the lubricity of the local clays. Now Pete was back, a skip in his walk and joy in his heart. He'd survived for three months in the bush. He'd done what no one had ever done before. His father would be so proud. There, in the back, at a poker game, sat Dan Worth. The guy looked good. Pete recognized the blonde beauty who stood beside his chair as Allison. Word was that she was running the girls who worked in the back. That, for the right money, she'd take a turn herself. And that, assuming a man could afford it, it was the kind of ride he'd never forget. Something, a subtle sense of warning, caused Pete to hesitate. An urge filled him to just turn around and walk out. Ah, foolishness. 
he started forward again, calling, Dan, you old scoundrel, how are you doing? Worth looked up, took a second, then smiled. Pete Morgan, how's life treating you? I've come to celebrate. Ollie Throlson and I have the first producing oil well on Donovan. It's just the start. We've a ways to go. Have to cobble together a refinery. But it's the fuel technology that we don't have to depend on solar system for. Glad to hear it. Dan chuckled, glancing up at Allison. My dear, this is Pete Morgan. The dire man who swore that Donovan was a disaster. Now look at him, dressed in Quetzal, wearing chamois, and by damn straight, as they say here, there's a pistol on his hip. You don't work in the bush without one, Pete told him. Can I buy you a drink? Sure. Worth disengaged himself from the game, slapped Pete on the shoulder, and led him over to the bar along the wall. This one's on me, Pete. Worth cocked his head as the drinks were poured. How long you been in town? Just got in. No more than an hour. Figured I'd come see how you're doing. You're a good man. Not everyone comes so quickly to pay their debts. Debts? The two thousand you owe me. Pete sipped at the whiskey. I don't understand. Yeah, Lots happened since then, huh? Worth reached in his back pocket, pulled out a little book, and started flipping through the pages. Hey, you don't mean... Dan, that was a joke. Worth's eyes had taken on a deadly glint when he looked up. I don't joke about debt, Pete. Two thousand yuan, remember? And surely it couldn't be my eyes. I'd swear you're dressed just like a Donovanian. But I don't have... First producing oil well? Ha! But you will, won't you? Feeling sick to his stomach, Pete Morgan nodded. Glancing over his shoulder, he could see Art Mannequin watching. A cold promise in his eyes... He'd heard about Mannequin. Fear sent its icy little fingers through him. Yeah. You know I'm good for it. You gotta love Donovan, don't you? Worth slapped him on the back again. Of course you're good for it. And we all know that well out there will pay. All I ask is a small part of it. Morgan could only nod. Epilogue Calico Aguila might have been many things. What she was not was stupid. Shigmozadek's words had sunk in with a passion. Oh, to be sure, you're struggling to surmount a lot of cultural debris clogging your mental pathways. But if you can manage to set that aside... Look past who you were back on Transluna. Ignore who you wanted to be back then. I think you're capable of great things on Donovan. That agility of thought and action he'd mentioned had taken only a couple of days to figure out after Turalon spaced. She had a heavy lift shuttle. Marines with tech. Equipment from Freelander, and a whole world to choose from. The outcrop on the southern flank of the Wind Mountains lay just inland from the Gulf, nearly five hundred clicks south of Port Authority. A thick forest of chibacho and the occasional mundo tree had covered a rich outcrop of gold, silver, and palladium intermixed with rare earth elements. The once deep deposit had been thrust up 
at an angle. Above it, the slope rose ever higher, finally ending in jagged peaks. Calico had simply ordered Spiro to scorch the ground with high explosives and incendiaries, just like she would if she were establishing a forward operating base in a hostile combat environment. Next, Calico had traded with a miner. His working bulldozer, in exchange for a selection of inoperative haulers from Freelander. Within a day, her people had bladed away the soil. A week after that, they had finished setting up an electrified perimeter fence, materials for which had been found in two Cylon containers from Freelander's hold. The great dome that had been stacked on the landing field had been raised in another two days. Starting tomorrow, the mining engineers she'd required to fulfill their contracts would begin the first rock fragmentation. Within a week, the samples would be flown off to Port Authority for assay. On the flat below the outcrop, several kilometers to the north, a second clearing beside the river was being hacked out of the forest. The smelter and farm would be established there. To date, as they'd built the compound, they'd only had to bury four men who'd fallen prey to the wildlife. Not a great record, but acceptable by Donovanian standards. The good news was that no one dared to desert, not with a bush just meters from the perimeter fence. That night, an hour before moonrise, she stood beneath the starry sky, Head tilted back, she stared up at the astral patterns and enjoyed the view. A frosting of soft, twinkling light laid atop the velvet black. Turalon had vanished just there, in front of that constellation, hundreds of thousands of kilometers from where she stood. Thank God I'm not on that ship. Would there be another? Ever? Calico smiled. Perhaps they'd already figured out the navigational problem back in Solar System. Even if they hadn't, human curiosity was what it was. It might be five years or ten, but eventually that terrible need to know would get the better of them. It would probably be a small scout and survey ship. Not the sort of thing to waste trillions of SDRs on, should it be lost. But eventually it would appear in Donovan's night sky. That was as inevitable as gravity. And when it does, she knotted a hard fist, it will find me here, and this planet will be mine. The End This is Elisa Bresnahan. We hope you have enjoyed this production of Outpost, Donovan Book One, by W. Michael Gear. Recorded books are available wherever audiobooks are sold, including audible.com, audiobooks.com, Apple iTunes, and in public libraries through RB Digital. Thank you for being...